Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 p.m. and serves as the City's policymaking and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rule of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. By City Ordinance, all remarks must be addressed to the City Council as a body and not to any City Council member, including the Mayor. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at SiouxFalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting SiouxFalls.org slash council or by calling the Council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, uh, Carnegie Town Hall. We certainly appreciate you being here, and, and also if you're watching on TV, we appreciate that as well. Today is Tuesday, September 12th, and uh, let's start our City Council meeting by introducing you to your City Council. Council Member Staley? Here. Erickson? Here. Er Erbenbach? Here. Kylie? Here. Neitzert? Here. Rolfing? Here. Selberg? Here. Starr? Present. Thank you, Councilors, for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, we are very, very blessed to have uh, Interim Pastor Jeff Backer with First Lutheran Church here, uh, who will lead us in our invocation tonight. Uh, Pastor Jeff is uh, doing a number of good things in our city, and so it's great to have you uh, leading this invocation as well. Thank you. What well, we'd ask, please stand for the invocation and then remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Pastor Jeff. On behalf of the family of faith here in downtown Sioux Falls at First Lutheran, it is my honor to be here tonight. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessings that you provide in your goodness. As you have promised, we receive your daily bread out of your provision. For those that confess you as God, and even for those that do not, you have established government for the protection and the provision of all people. We thank you for those that have been called to service and leadership for the sake of the people. And those that visit this great community, bless them in their time. We would ask that you would give all here charged with leadership wisdom, patience, and guidance. There are certainly challenges that exist in all communities, and we ask for your continued guidance and steadfast provision. Diversity is part of your amazing creation, and help us to navigate cultures, processes, and systems that would cause hardship to others. We pray for the areas of your world tonight, God, where there is struggle, where there is loss. Let your goodness and peace be known in those areas, and we give thanks that you have protected our great city again. Empower people from here to go and help. We pray especially for those that have come before this council tonight to lay their concerns and their joys into public consideration. And as this council takes up their work, let us all know that this comes by your will and goodness. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, Janet, would you mind coming forward? Really appreciate it. Uh, Janet, would you please introduce yourself, please, and uh, any other guests, too? We, we'd appreciate it uh, before I read the proclamation. Sure. Uh, I'm Janet Kidonsali. I'm the president of the Helpline Center, and this is Taylor Funky from the Helpline Center also. Thank you. Janet Taylor, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I do have a proclamation that I would love to read on behalf of uh, the people of our great city. Whereas one person in the United States dies by suicide every 11 Point nine minutes. Whereas suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States and the second leading cause of death amongst young people between the ages of 15 and 24. Whereas suicide is the ninth leading cause of death overall in South Dakota and the second leading cause of death among people under the age of 35 in our great state. Whereas it is estimated that there are over one million people in the United States who are survivors of suicide loss each year. Whereas in South Dakota, folks, in South Dakota, there were 173 deaths by suicide in 2016. Whereas 33 people in Minnehaha County lost their lives to suicide in 2016. Whereas in 2016, the Helpline Center in Sioux Falls, thanks to the leadership of uh, folks like this, they answered 1,538 suicide-related calls through 211 and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. That number again, 1-800-273-8255. Whereas our community can work together to reduce the stigma associated with mental illness and suicidality. Thank you. And encourage people at risk to seek life-saving help. Or as the Helpline Center, as the only crisis line in South Dakota accredited by that American uh, Association is dedicated to reducing the frequency of suicide attempts and deaths and the pain of survivors affected by suicides of their loved ones through their suicide prevention intervention, and yes, aftercare efforts. Now, therefore, I'm Mike Uther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim September 10th through the 16th uh, as Suicide Prevention Week in Sioux Falls. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for bringing this to attention of our great people, and thanks for all you do. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Councilors, thank you for uh, that opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, we now will move to our consent agenda. Council, any uh, motions? For, yes, uh, Council Vice Chair. Yes, um, I'd like to pull item. I'm sorry here. Um, entertainment venues, um, CSL International contract for sixty-three thousand five hundred. Very good. Thank you, Councilor Vice Chair. Appreciate it. Um, yes, Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd also like to, uh, on the uh, report of change orders, uh, discuss uh, the first one, the entertainment venues, Project uh, 13005, please. Thank you, Councilor Starr. Uh, the other items, Councilors, any uh, motions on those? Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Starr. Council Vice Chair Erickson has made a motion to approve uh, the remaining items on the consent agenda. Seconded by Councilor Starr. Uh, a roll call, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Now, our regular agenda tonight, any changes to that? Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Second. Kylie. Councillor uh, Erickson has made a motion to approve our agenda tonight. Seconded by Councillor uh, 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 Chair Kylie. Um, any other motions? Councillor Vice Chair Erickson. I make a motion to amend the regular agenda by moving item 10 to be immediately following item um, number 6. Second. Very good. There's been a motion to amend the regular agenda tonight by moving agenda item 10 to immediately follow agenda item number 6. That has been seconded. A roll call, please. 
Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is a poll, uh, past 8 0. Now a vote on the amended motion, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Thank you, Council. That is past 8 0. Welcome, folks. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, this is our public input portion of our, of our meeting. It's a great opportunity for you to engage the council, really in any topic that is of, of, of importance to you. If there's a topic that's on the agenda later on, we'd ask you to wait for that opportunity. But right now, just come forward, uh, really just a couple things. Uh, introduce yourself to the people of our town. Please keep your comments to five minutes or less. Uh, we just ask you to be professional, uh, respectful in, in, your, in your content and demeanor. On that, uh, just please come forward. Welcome. My name is Chris Parsley. I'm president of Falls Area Bicyclists. We are the nonprofit advocacy organization for bicyclists in Sioux Falls. I'm also certified by the League of American Bicyclists as a cycling instructor. I'm here speaking on behalf of the bicycling community in Sioux Falls. According to the police department, as of last Thursday, 18 drivers have been ticketed for illegal turns on a red light at 10th and Minnesota Avenue so far in 2017. Last Thursday, I did some data collection of my own. I set up a GoPro camera for an hour, and I filmed people turning right off of Minnesota onto 10th Street for one hour. During that time, 119 drivers turned right. 17 of those turned while the light was red. Six of those 17 did not come to a complete stop. Five of those six turned while pedestrians were present at the intersection. One was a City of Sioux Falls sewer vacuum truck. The pedestrian actually had to run to get out of the way of a large yellow truck with the logo of our city on the side of it. Not one of the 17 that turned right on red even gave so much as a cursory glance to the right to check and see if there was any traffic on the sidewalk. Their heads did not even begin to turn to the right until they were almost halfway around the corner. Two of the drivers who turned to this corner, one on a red, one on a green, didn't look in either direction. They were looking down at their phones while turning right. This was one hour in one day at one intersection. One has to imagine this isn't an isolated problem for 10th and Minnesota. People's lives are at stake here. Three of the last five people killed while bicycling in Sioux Falls were hit by right-turning motorists looking to their left before turning right. And in 2003, a pedestrian was killed at this very intersection where I filmed. Some people cannot drive cars. Maybe they made poor choices. Maybe they have a medical condition that prevents them from operating a motor vehicle. Whatever the reason, walking or riding a bicycle is their mode of transportation. They have places to be, people to meet, and things to do. Just like the rest of us driving motor vehicles, they should be able to travel safely to their destination. It was demonstrated recently by the City of Sioux Falls that convenient motor vehicle travel is much more important than pedestrian or bicyclist safety. It's been reported that the changes made to the signage at this intersection, this one intersection in town, is going to save drivers an average of 22 seconds. There's a cheaper and much more effective alternative. Set your alarm one minute earlier. Every one of us has seen that other driver looking at their phone while driving. If you haven't seen it, then you need to put the phone down. Most, if not all of us, have turned right, many of us on the way here tonight. And how many of you did not look to the right before stepping on the gas pedal? Many times, nothing bad happens. But when something does happen, it's usually really bad. Pedestrians and bicyclists are vulnerable road, road users, and they never fare well when they tangle with someone driving a motor vehicle. I ask the leadership of Sioux Falls to think beyond saving drivers 22 seconds. I would rather see my tax dollars spent on stronger traffic enforcement. If you're going to make a change that saves drivers time and keeps pedestrians safe, then follow through with what you say. What I filmed last week on Thursday at this one intersection for one hour on one day is a recipe for disaster. And I hope something changes before someone gets hurt or worse, killed. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Remember me? My name is Patrick Lally. I'm host of the Patrick Lally Show on KSOO Information 1000. 
And uh, I've been talking about this issue since the news first broke last week. And uh, I'm as disturbed now as I was then um, about the taking down the uh, uh, no turn on red or putting up the pedestrian when pedestrians are present signs and changing the policies there. And uh, the reason I'm disturbed on a personal level is I was an Argus Leader employee in 2003 when Edie Adams was killed. And that was 14 years ago. And I think we've forgotten what that moment was like. Um, in broad sense, but I tell you the people who worked there that day have not forgotten because they've been in contact with me and they sent me very many pa impassioned notes about what they remembered about Edie and what they remembered about that day. And the number of people walking across that street has gone down because the number of people working at the Argus Leader is fewer. The number of people working in the Quest building next door is fewer. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow somebody won't buy the Quest building and put a bunch more employees back in there. And it doesn't mean that there aren't people down there. And I would submit to you that this intersection is like any other section in this town. It's in a neighborhood. And yes, it's the intersection of two state highways. And yes, they're both major thoroughfares for our community. But I will tell you that it's a neighborhood. Just like the cul-de-sac in your neighborhood, just like the quiet street in McKenna Park or Tut Hill or Hilltop or West Sioux or the North End or anywhere else. It's a neighborhood and it's full of kids and it's full of people doing their business. And I worked down there for 18 years and I saw people driving the wrong way every day. I saw cars spinning around that corner every day. I saw people that I know get hit and not killed. Very recently an Argus Leader employee was knocked down to the point where he needed an ambulance at that corner. And yes, it's only one intersection in one part of our city. But a woman died at the same spot where we held a press conference to announce it. And that's disturbing to a lot of people who knew Edie. But beyond that, this is a bigger question. This is a larger issue about planning and transportation. Why do we think we're the only city in the country that isn't changing, that isn't growing, that isn't morphing, where the young people are not as interested in driving cars, where mass transit is important, where walkability in all neighborhoods is important. I know a lot, of, I'm, I love this city. I was born here, I grew up here. My father, who I believe is here, was born here and grew up here. His father was born here and grew up here. My mother, her mother, and her grandmother, same thing. So when I say these things, it is from a great place of love. And I want this to be a better place. And this one intersection in this one part of town isn't that big a deal, right? But what's it say about us going forward? It says that we only care about driving cars and that moving traffic is more important than safety. And why? Why is this happening now? Why? And who? Who made the decision? We I mean, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people know. I'm not, you know, I'm not in City Hall. I, I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. And I saw the email from uh, Director Cotter that went out today, and it's full of a lot of really good stuff, really good stuff that's happening in this city. Man, I tell you what, the, the, the city led the state in terms of bike laws and bikeability. The city leads this area in a lot of great ways. But this is a step back. And there's no other way to see it. And I, I just hope, my only point is, I hope going forward that we'll consider the ramifications of these decisions and what they mean in the big picture, and not just one intersection in one part of the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on any topic of interest to you? Welcome. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Stephen Ciano. I've talked with you in the past, and uh, I've generally not made a good presentation, partly because, or much because of the physical side of my uh, disability. I've had trouble 
breathing, and which should have been noticeable, I would think, to this body. And standing is uh, difficult. But I also have uh, emotional and social disability uh, as of 1978, which has been covered up in an effort to uh, deny me uh, life-sustaining medical needs. This has been recently compounded. This has been on the federal, uh, state, um, county, local level. And uh, I've asked you people repeatedly to uh, do something about the locals. There are crimes being committed. In order to cover up the, uh, my actual condition and the situation, uh, people have committed fraud and defamed me, falsely depicting me as delusional so as to discredit me and my uh, charges. I have asked the police, I have asked the city attorneys, I have asked this body repeatedly to do something about it. I had police at my house where I was living, uh, concerned for my welfare supposedly, and I told them what was going on, and I was told, well, you can go to DAV or a local attorney, private attorney. Well, excuse me, there's crimes going on here. You're a police officer. Why don't you investigate and prosecute, maybe arrest these people involved? People have reportedly stolen about $300,000 in my name. That's identity theft while depriving me of any income for years, which was expected to cause my death, and certainly did cause harm. I want this body to do something, not dismiss it as, oh, well, you need counseling. Oh, well, it's not our responsibility. Um, or, oh, we're, we get annoyed with such uh, reports. Oh, this is so tiresome. No, I know what I'm speaking of. I know the law. I know natural law. I know American law. I know the crimes being committed. And you want to give me more time? You want to have a conversation? I can explain in more detail, as I have with your human relations people, who then claim to be not answerable to you, but to the federal government. Everyone's passing the buck, but as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. We're now down to the local level, and I say find some police, some prosecutor to take this on. People are committing, this constitutes attempted murder, and few people that do nothing in light of this is horrendous. Thank you. Stephen, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Folks, uh, anybody else? Welcome. Mayor, Council, I'm Michael Christensen. Um, right turns are a problem. Um, you, Mayor, I read in the paper said that we'd look to our left and we'd look to our right. Nobody is there, yet we still can't go. Um, Chief of Police says it's not the sign that makes a difference, it's not the light that makes the difference, it's them paying attention, them drivers, having their head on a swivel, seeing are there pedestrians. Um, and, and we know that drivers don't do that. Um, we know that when we're out walking with our wives in the evenings and going someplace with any traffic volume that you come to the driver who's turning right and they're looking that way and they're not looking over here at you and you take out your five guys burgers and fries and put it on their hood and unwrap your burger and take a bite and you, they still haven't noticed you there. Um, and so we know drivers don't do that. In fact, my own father's experience at 43rd in Minnesota as he stood on the corner waiting to cross um, he knew that the driver first in line wasn't looking at him, so he waited, but he didn't realize that the driver second in line also wouldn't take the time to notice him, and they took a different line and knocked him over there. Um, I uh, was working um, at the same place that the driver that turned right out of our driveway going to launch onto 49th Street killed Natasha Adams while she crossed her path on her bicycle. Um, that, too, was a driver was my coworker looking down the street that way, but turning this way and not looking here. Um, you hear drivers say they came out of nowhere, and that tends to be what that thing is, where they're looking over here 
and not noticing what's to their right. Um, Chris said three of, the last, three of the last five car bike fatalities have been right turning drivers. Um, the last two were cited failure to exercise due care because they didn't look to their right. Um, I have the 60 crash reports report given to the state, um, Sioux Falls crash reports, 60 car bike crash reports that happened in 2014 and 2015, that's two a month, right? 42% of them are drivers turning right. All the rest is everything else that could possibly happen to a bike rider and a car. Um, I don't have pedestrian data because we paid $360 to get these, me and a couple of friends, and you know, I'm just a poor bike rider, so I couldn't afford that. Um, finally, just the last piece is uh, this summer, spring, um, Chris and I trained your Sioux area metro drivers and staff um, because a bike bus driver incident was reported to them and the management reviewed the video and saw something that scared them so much that they needed to do more. When we teach bicyclists and drivers about safe driving around bicyclists, we say the worst thing you can do is ride your bike on the sidewalk facing traffic because of that driver that's turning right, looking left, and not noticing you. And the, the proximity is so close that there's not time to make any adjustments, so fatalities happen there. Um, when we gave that message to the bus drivers, look right before you turn right. Um, the management was very interested in that and very glad that we brought that message from our perspective because they have drivers with that issue. So while this, yes, is a small decision, it's a larger issue, more intersections that could find this, have these changes made, leads to more trouble. And so um, I'm here with my friends lamenting the decision and hoping that these facts can adjust future decisions. Thank you. Michael, thank you as well. And Council, I was going to let you know, even though there's been some similar topics on Right on Red, I think it's been unique for the most part, uh, different aspects on the topic, so hope you don't mind. Um, folks, other topics uh, or other comments? Very good. Welcome. Scott Harrisman, Sioux Falls. Um, first thing, I got a couple things here. First thing I want to talk about is the recent email I got this week about the easements that are going to be approved for the Arc of Dreams and the building permits. I'm still befuddled and still struggling with the fact that a nonprofit in Sioux Falls would commission a $1.6 million sculpture um, from a internationally known sculpture artist before ever getting one lick of approval from the city. Ponder that. My next thing is uh, I saw at the informational today that uh, we're gonna be paying off the Lewis and Clark bond early. That's awesome. We're gonna save about $25 million. I was against that bond to begin with. I thought it was foolish to spend $70 million to get 10% of our water through a pipe. I also felt at the time, I think I had a long discussion with Councilor Staggers at the time, that the federal government should be helping to pay for this. Um, ironically, about three years ago, I was at a political event up in Minneapolis and I ran into Senator Al Franken, who at the time was uh, trying to get money for Lewis and Clark from Minnesota and Iowa. And I was explaining to him about how the city of Sioux Falls took out a $70 million bond without any federal money to basically bail Lewis and Clark out because I can tell you, if they wouldn't have got that $70 million from us back then, Lewis and Clark would have been in a whole world of hurt. Um, so I guess it's good that we're paying it off. But one thing that concerned me today was that we have $36 million sitting in a reserve fund for the enterprise funds. We have been told over the past 10, 15 years, increase water rates, increase water rates, increase water rates, increase water rates. Why? because we need it for infrastructure. We need to upgrade all these water pipes. We need to fix all these streets. We need to do all this stuff. And what did we do with all these water increases? We stuck it in a savings account. $36 million worth of money that could have went back into our economy sat in a savings account. That is really misguided. And we were, and we were lied to. I mean, we were lied to. We kept, we're told that we needed this money 
for infrastructure and we stuck it in a savings account. Speaking of lies, my last topic here, probably saw the news this week about how uh, the parks director denied that uh, we, uh, we had a no mo list. I guess it just it was all in their heads. They just memorized it or something. It was never on a piece of paper or, or in the computer or anything. Well, then they got caught that they actually did have a no mo list. Now, this council and mayor like to praise city directors all the time about all the great work they do. And that's wonderful when they do a good job. But what happens when they don't do a good job? What happens when they lack integrity and lie to the public and lie to the media? They need to own up to that too and apologize. I believe the parks director owes the public an apology for lying. Doesn't matter what he lied about, but he lied. Thank you. Folks, anybody else? Item number five. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. We have a couple items. Councilor, thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, my apologies. No Council Vice Chair Erickson. Uh, let's move to, there were a couple of items on the consent agenda, uh, starting uh, Councilor Vice Chair Erickson. Wanted to ch chat about entertainment venues. Yes, um, the item that we were talking about um, is the CSL International um, contract, and I know uh, Director Turbach, I believe, is here. If I could ask just Director a couple Turbach? of questions. Um, just pulled the contract and looked at this, and I wanted just to have just a little brief conversation um, in regards to this. Um, I think that it's fantastic that we're trying to um, utilize our space as much as possible and find out the best way um, possible for this. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little dialogue from you and then ask a couple questions in regards to the contract, if that's okay. Sure. Well, we've got, uh, what, about three years under our belt now with the event center, and uh, I think I've learned a lot about how that complex functions of the, the event center, the convention center, and the arena function together as a unit. Um, and the limitations uh, that, that exist. So it, uh, it, it seems a pr an, like an appropriate time to take a long-term look at what the future is for the old arena and whether or not there isn't a, a better long-term solution as to how to utilize that facility. Um, and that's, that's really the, the driving purpose behind the agreement with CSL to evaluate um, what other opportunities there might be for that building or for that space that the building occupies. Um, there really aren't any preconceived notions about what that ought to be, um, but it's, uh, it, it seems appropriate at this time anyway to, to at least begin the discussion about what, what the long-term outlook might be. As a uh, kind of in conjunction with that, the, we will ask CSL to take a look at the Orpheum Theater as well um, that that facility has been a struggle to to uh, maximize the utilization, and so that's something that they will be looking at that the Orpheum as well. I think that was something that uh, kind of a seed that was planted by Councillor Starr here a while ago to look at if there weren't other other perhaps op opportunities for the Orpheum Theater. So that's really what this uh, uh, this proposal or this agreement is all about. Okay, thank you. And if I could add a couple. No, follow please. In the contract, I know it states that it's done, um, the agreement shall terminate on December 31st, 2017. So I think that uh, we as a council, I don't want to speak for everyone, just kind of talking to amongst ourselves. We're certainly very interested um, to hear what the outcome of this would be if we can be sure to schedule that right away uh, as we uh, move forward with that. My question is in regards to the Sioux Falls Stadium. Um, is that something that can be reviewed as well? I mean, if we're looking at that complex as a whole, why not? the Canary Stadium as well, because it's all right there. I certainly don't want to water down this contract, but I don't know if there's an option to amend it and be able to include uh, the stadium. We have, a, in my opinion, a lot of money slated for upgrades to that and repairs to keep it in a workable condition. Um, and if that's the case, but it's maybe not the best purpose, I certainly don't want to appropriate $800,000 for that stadium for those repairs if we can figure out something else. Yeah, I guess a couple of thoughts I'd, I'd share on, on that uh, facility. One, we, we have a, a current tenant um, 
the, the Canaries baseball team uh, has a lease for that facility currently. Mm -hmm. And if they exercise all of their rights for extensions, they, they, could, they could be there for another 12 years before a, another renewal agreement um, would be necessary. So I guess in the back of my mind, that's, that's quite, a, quite a long time to really, um, between the time we might take a look at the long-term view and when we might actually be able to, to do something different with that facility, um, it, it's really hard to envision doing anything with the baseball stadium other than using it as a baseball stadium, um, particularly since we're, we are obligated, I guess, under that lease to, to continue to pro provide that facility. That's, that's kind of my thought on that. As far as whether or not it could be um, evaluated or studied as part of, the, part of this agreement, um, I, there's no, no reason why it couldn't be, I guess, that I can think of. I, if you want to entertain that possibility, I would, I would uh, move forward with the current agreement as it's proposed. If we want to look at perhaps adding that to the scope of work, maybe extending that contract later into, into next year, uh, into next year's budget, maybe that would be a, an appropriate way to, to do that if, if we really want to. I'm wanna not advocating for moving the stadium or changing any agreements with the Canaries, but we've asked SMG to take that responsibility on as far as programming it, and so right. why not give them the best tools possible to utilize that space any way that we can um, before we sink some more money into it. Um, is there additional funding left over that we could increase that or have that conversation with them to know what, you know, are we looking at an extra 5,000? Are we looking at an extra 20,000? You know, what is that amount? I know that we've been trying to be very mindful mm -hmm. of, of any money spent uh, as we've seen the sales yeah, tax off. I could only speculate as to what, what that might entail in terms of their, their fee. Like I say, I, I think if we were if we're willing to wait a little bit longer and and extend the process into next year right. certainly that gives us more flexibility in terms of funding right i certainly would be interested in that i know i'm only one voice but i think that with it being a complex that certainly makes sense the other thing that i just want to draw attention to in the contract uh, it says i'm just going to read it. it says analyze the viability of replacement of the arena and use of the site area for options that include space additions to the convention center new hotel development and or other hospitality or commercial uses and i, I mean i know that can i'm not jumping the gun here i'm not trying to sound like skies falling or anything like that but I, I just find that statement very interesting because I know the whole reason why that location was such a hot topic was for the floor space and so I just when I read that I thought oh gosh I thought we needed all this floor space to be able to host additional events moving forward but maybe they'll find something differently maybe they'll have um, better recommendations but I certainly would love to see the Sioux Falls Stadium involved in there and obviously would uh, support moving that as well and look forward to additional information okay thank you Mayor. Uh, yes, Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director, I guess one of the things, once we've found where this money's coming from, I guess my concern is, is that it's coming from an operating budget that wasn't necessarily designated, at least when we approved the budget, as a place for, um, to hire a consultant. So my concern is what maintenance aren't we doing because we're spending the 60, Three thousand six hundred or five hundred dollars. Sorry, I'm ready for bifocals here shortly. Um, Sixty-three thousand five hundred uh, out of a hundred thousand dollar operating budget. So it concerns me that this might have gotten missed somewhere in the the process. Or I think we had the intent of doing this, but we didn't. We're we're taking it out of an operating budget. So what aren't we doing? Um, as we know, the the arena is an older building and always is in need of uh, some maintenance and things. So I'm a little concerned that that we're taking the money out of there to, to pay for this? Yeah, there, the, the short answer to that is there, there aren't any repairs or maintenance that are, are gonna be postponed or delayed in order to, to accomplish this contract. But, but it does really, your question really does go to kind of the timing of it. And it, it's one of the things we talked about, uh, or at least I discussed with some of the counselors regarding future investment in the arena. There are a number of fairly sizable capital investments that are on the horizon for us in the arena. And I think it, it, it's appropriate to evaluate what the long-term mm. vision is for that facility before we get to the budget cycle next year and need to begin to make some decisions. Are we going to continue in, to invest more dollars into that building or is the long-term direction gonna change? So 
uh, that's really, uh, I guess, the, the best answer I can give you as to, to kind of the timing of it. Um, we, uh, we've, we've, this is something that we've kind of been planned to do or envisioned to do for some time. The dollars clearly are, are, have become available. They're clearly not going to get utilized uh, in the 17 budget, so it seems the timing seems appropriate to me to, to get that uh, get the study done ahead of our next year's uh, capital planning process. Okay, if I may, Mr. Mayor, if oh, I please. do one more to, to follow up. Um, I, I guess I want to echo Councillor Erickson's concerns as well about the Canary Stadium. As we invest in 18 in the budget, somewhere around $800,000 in repairs, it just seems like we're acting in different silos because the convention center and arena and the Orpheum are under finance where the Canary Stadium is under uh, parks. And I was hoping that before we invest or continue to invest in the Canary Stadium that we've made a commitment, at least from a policy side from this body, that we want to continue there. I think we'll see some real parking concerns this week at the concert. Uh, or the uh, nine concerts that will be there that I think parking is a, a major concern and there has been some talk and I haven't been an advocate of this but at least want to at least start the discussion process of moving the baseball stadium downtown that it fits there and before we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars on a continual basis putting band-aids together in an older stadium just like the arena like you pointed out that we would uh, do that as well so i think it would make more sense to to consider the entire complex as we're looking at it as well the other thing that uh, concerns me about uh, investing in this consultant is that we have probably the best uh, management company in the country with smg and it seems like I, I'm trying to balance where why that w work wouldn't be done by the management company that we have in place that we're negotiating with to renew their contract, um, increasing the food service or having them move to the Canary Stadium and that part of it. So why is this work separate from a consultant versus what we're getting from the management company? Well, it's, it's a very different skill set, a very different expertise in terms of doing an economic analysis, evaluating uh, marketing, or, or markets, um, that kind of thing. SMG is, is an expert at running these facilities, booking events, that kind of thing. But in terms of the developing a long-term vision and, and assessing the economic viability of a facility, that's really the where, where CSL their their bread and butter. And and they are you know this this isn't a company that uh, is just kind of off the street. I mean this is somebody that the city has done uh, business with in the past, and they've got just uh, uh, outstanding credentials to do this, this type of uh, analysis for us. So I, I would really caution you against having anyone other than them take that task on. Thank you. Councilor Neiser. Thank you. Just real quick, I just wanted to mention that I had expressed the concern about the arena before the budget cycle started because I knew that there's a lot of major capital that would need to go into it. So I'm in full support of taking a fresh look and, and seeing where we want to go with it. I have no preconceived notions, and I know the argument was flat floor space years ago, but let's look at it fresh and see what is happening on the ground now and make the best decision before we uh, start to uh, invest in major capital. As far as the Canaries, I had read that contract about a week ago, and it does set forth a number of things that the Canaries do get, and they have certain rights and certain days that they, that they can use the stadium. But there are other days that we are free to use it and so maybe that's something where if you were to look at this you know maybe amending that contract that they could maybe look and see within the parameters of the existing contract how could we leverage it and be able to hold events or do some of these other things and really maximize the use out of an asset so thanks right and and to that point counselor i mean that is more in the the, the sweet spot of what smg will do and that's that's why i'm excited uh, eventually, and, and I've talked to you about that before, the, the plan is to pull the stadium in under SMG's oversight and management. So they are the experts really at determining uh, appropriate events to hold in the venue and going out and finding those events and booking them. And that's something that we haven't really been taking advantage of, uh, those, those opportunities that exist under the contract. But you know, CSL, like I say, is, is more of a, a long-term uh, visionary look at, at uh, you know, what we want that uh, building to be utilized for in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. 
Folks, uh, would anybody want to make a motion on this particular consent agenda uh, uh, item? Move to approve Erickson's. Second, Urban Council Councilor Erickson's made a motion to approve just this uh, one consent agenda item. It was seconded by <coughs> Councilor Erpenbach. We've had good discussion. A roll call vote, please, on just this one agenda item. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? <laughs> no. That is passed seven to one. Councilor Starr had wanted to discuss change order project 1035. No, 13005. Thir okay, thank you very much, Councilor. Appreciate it. Councilor Starr? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tr uh, Director, if you could just give us an idea where um, this is a, a change order for the Suvals Convention Center, the building improvements. Just give us a quick idea of what we've done some major remodeling. I mean, we're at that point with the convention center where it needed some things. The, the uh, premier center needed some uh, upgrades, whether it's coolers and how that all worked. And we've invested a considerable amount of money. But uh, at the same time, this is a change order for $180,772. So if you could just give us an idea of what changed, what happened, where we we're doing that and then what budget and where that additional funds are coming from? Well, I'll do my best. Uh, this, this is one that, that came up fairly late in the day, so you, you get a finance guy talking uh, a little bit of construction for, uh, with you, so what you see is what you get. Um, I can tell you that the project overall is about a $2 million project um, to, to really in, improve the envelope of the building for the convention center, so it involves um, uh, refurbishing the drive it on the outside of the building, which is kind of the, the, the reddish colored uh, surface on that, that really goes entirely around the building. Um, it also involves replacement of the, a lot of the windows and, and what they call the curtain wall on the front of the building. If you're standing south of the building and looking at the front of it, there's a lot of glass there. A lot of those windows are getting replaced. So it's, it's primarily a project to uh, enhance the, the, the envelope of the building and, and make sure that it's, it's watertight. There have been from time to time water problems with the facility and so that's the overall intent of the, the project. The, uh, the change order really came about and, and I, can, I can read this uh, description to you because it says it better than, than what I can, but it's, uh, the change order is necessary to repair the parapet wall all the way around the convention center building. The parapet wall is really the the, the short wall that's up on the, on the roof, if you're standing on the roof, that's what would keep you from falling off the roof, I suppose. Um, the, the problem uh, was discovered during the application of the new drive it uh, on the building. There were a number of openings in the parapet that was uh, clearly indicating that it was allowing water uh, to, uh, to penetrate the building during heavy rain. So there was um, the cap on the parapet wall needs to be watertight to prevent water from getting behind the drive it down into the wall and eventually into the building and, and doing damage. And so when they began the work on the drive it, they discovered that the, the cap on the parapet wall wasn't properly sealing out the weather. Um, and so that was leaving the building susceptible to water leaks during a heavy rain. Um, so the, the change order will uh, provide for the installation of a new weathertight cap all the way around the building uh, and seal it up to prevent moisture from getting into the building. So that's that's a hundred eighty thousand dollar change order on what uh, initially was, like I say, about a two million dollar project. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Nicer. I, I would only add I I looked into this a little bit last week and I think it's one of those deals where you know you you open something up and you just find something you don't expect and in terms of the convention center and I'll say this about the pavilion I I was having a discussion with a former uh, city councilor who was talking about the history they were on the council at the time and they had mentioned that you know this that particular project the convention center was going over budget and and some things were done maybe a little more inexpensively and it's a pay me now or pay me later sort of a deal where like with the pavilion as well there's we're putting in a lot of capital right now but there was things that were you know maybe you did a more affordable roof and so it it, it looks like a lot but it's we're essentially taking care of things that maybe we could have taken care of on the front end and we're doing it right so Council, would anybody want to make a motion on this? Particular Actually, agenda? Mr. Mayor, yeah, I, Council I, Star? I believe this is an informational item for oh. the council, so I don't believe we have to vote, but I double check. Oh. No, nope. thank you. Yes. Sounds great. Sounds great. Then, if you don't mind, Council, 
Can we move on to item? The other one, why don't we vote? Yeah, why don't we vote on that this one? That one was, a, go ahead, Councilor. Uh, if I may, Mayor, this, this is a notice of a change order and those are not approved by the council. They're merely put as a communication under the consent agenda. So, uh -huh. Councilor Starr is correct. It's not an approval item. Great job. Item number five. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 38 of the Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to elections. Tom. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'll review what I went through last week. Uh, very briefly, this is a change to our election ordinance, Chapter 38. A lot of this is reflective of what was passed by the state legislature this past session. Uh, the first primary change is that we'll remove the definitions. This doesn't mean that definitions don't apply. It's just that we'll, uh, we've adopted those that are already in the state statutes. Uh, it's easier for the candidates to go straight to the state statute than try to figure out what the difference between the two is. Uh, consequently, there currently is, or before the changes, there were no differences. So deleting the definitions, the next portion uh, that we'll take a look at is within the reporting requirements. The first item um, right there that's stricken out is we've just adjusted where we have certain requirements for uh, submitting uh, statements of financial interest, both for candidates and for elected officials. This is reflective of that. Uh, the next portion there just reiterates the requirement for candidates to submit a statement of organization once they meet the criteria that's outlined in state law. Uh, other items that are in here, uh, right here, a requirement for failed ballot question committees to submit a, a termination statement, campaign find, finance disclosure statement uh, at, during February the, of the year following uh, the opening of the uh, particular committee. Uh, next down here, this again is reflective of state law change that occurred this past spring. Uh, and this says basically that each year elected officials will submit a statement of financial interest, which is a change uh, from the past. Finally, right here, uh, the requirement, if there are any corrections noted, uh, the deadline or the time allotted to the candidate or the, ballot or the political committee to make those changes is three days. Right now, state law changed from three to seven days. Uh, it's probably more reasonable for us at this level to have a three-day uh, deadline, especially given our deadlines right before the election. Uh, the last portion is down here in election results. The state changed uh, use of the term secondary to runoff consistently through the statutes. Now, also, we've added, and it's already in statute, a provision for if there's a tie for second place uh, if a runoff's needed. Uh, and that explains the process both for the elections by plurality and election by majority. Uh, with that, that's all I have, uh, subject to any questions. Tom, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. And Council, before I go to you, this is a second reading. Folks, is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak about this particular item? Council? Uh, sir, please, folks. Thank you. Mayor, Council, for the record, George Hahn, third generation resident of Sioux Falls. Tonight, you have an opportunity to unravel a perfectly good governmental system, election system that has been in place for 23 years. If we'd had the proposal, proposed system in place, a lot of you wouldn't be sitting up here. I voted for all the at-larges. I voted for my district person. I voted for my man, Mike, twice. And uh, you might not have been elected mayor had we had other systems in place. I don't know why we're proposing a change other than to force upon the community an elitist system of representation in our districts and at large. To seek a city council seat right now is a six to $10,000 expenditure. Most anybody can muster that up or get donations. Mayors, two to 300,000 without any question. If we have to have a majority on the council seats uh, the vote cost goes up exponentially as the majority has to be the rule and guide instead of a plurality. We could easily see a thirty to $50,000 cost to get elected to a council seat. Now, that excludes a lot of average citizen involved voters who might want to represent their area. It involves elitists who are going to have to have very large donations very significant political machines in order to get elected. And when we have that kind of an elitist government, the pathway is now paved for the possibility of substantial special interest interference. Corruption is possible. 
and it doesn't accomplish anything that's really good for a city like Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Please consider very carefully your vote tonight because you had the unique opportunity to destroy a perfectly good system that has been in place for 23 years. The cost of a runoff is chump change. I don't care if it's 60, 80, 100,000. That's a price of doing business in a democracy. Elections aren't free and we can't shirk the expense and that is the only ostensible reason I've heard anybody say, oh, let's, let's just get a majority then we don't have to have an $80,000 runoff. That is not a good reason. That doesn't make sense. Please consider your vote carefully. Thank you. Thank you, George. Welcome. Robert Colby. As the uh, previous speaker said about changing the ordinance or the, uh, I'd like to distill things down to the basic bottom line. It looks as though we have to congratulate some people because they have a perfectly good solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Thank you, Bob, or Mr. Colby, thank you, welcome. Good evening. I'm John Mathias from Sioux Falls, and I believe this amendment for the majority vote requirement should be withdrawn or defeated. Um, per the mayor's request, I will not repeat the portion of my remarks that I prepared that were so eloquently um, put by Mr. Hahn, pertaining specifically to elitism in government. I will, I will not repeat my sentiments uh, to that effect. But I would like to say that I feel that this proposal is ill-timed and ill-advised. The author and the council members seconding the amendment both have had years in office to propose such a change to our election code. Yet the proposal comes from them near the end of their terms and coincidentally just months prior to another city council election. I feel this timing regrettably makes the motivation behind the proposal suspect. Perhaps this proposal is not just about good government. Perhaps this proposal is more self-serving or in service to a special interest. Aside from the timing of this proposed amendment hinting at an effort to influence the outcome of the upcoming city council election, I can personally attest under oath, if necessary, of the potential for a personal motivation to design this amend amendment to benefit one announced candidate in particular. That candidate, well financed but unsuccessful in the last council election, has announced his candidacy once again for the at-large seat being vacated by Council Rolfing. This candidate displayed, displayed a Rolfing for Counselor campaign sign in his front yard during the 2014 council election campaign. I believe there is an acquaintance here beyond that of just candidate and anonymous voter. In a recent radio interview, this candidate asserted he felt he would have won his race in 2016 had there been a runoff. And this candidate is quoted by the Argus Leader online today as saying he supports a majority requirement in council races because, quote, it's more representative and conclusive and fair to all voters and candidates, end quote. Given the relationship and remarks of the parties involved, it is my opinion that this proposal could be perceived as having been created by the aforementioned parties and promoted to favor this candidate in particular. Are these all coincidences? Perhaps, but perception can be considered reality. Lastly, during council deliberations on proposed municipal code changes in the re recent past, and I'm going to repeat Mr. Colby's remarks, we've heard councilor opposition characterize a proposal as a solution in search of a problem. 
I believe this is very much the case with this amendment. Furthermore, I've suggested to this council on a prior occasion the virtue of going to great lengths to avoid the appearance of impropriety. By defeating this amendment, this council can uphold their belief in an assessment of an undesirable solution in search of a problem and take an important stand in avoiding the appearance of impropriety. Thank you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on this topic? Welcome. Hi, uh, Zach DeBort. Um, I'll, I'll try not to repeat any of the, the statements made, um, but uh, the individual council seats do not have the same amount of importance as a mayoral election. Uh, it's not the same pay, uh, not the same level of importance, uh, and they don't hold the same amount of power. Uh, to, to hold them to the same election standards to me uh, doesn't make sense. Uh, I do understand the thought process uh, behind the proposed amendment uh, that you know, we should find the best candidate, one that has the most support. Um, but if it comes at the cost of edging out candidates that can't afford to campaign the additional three weeks uh, for a runoff election, I don't think it's worth it. Uh, the additional money and the additional time for a position that is part-time uh, doesn't, it, it feels like it, it's, it's giving an advantage to someone who can afford to pay for those additional uh, campaign weeks. Uh, if the council is worried about finding the candidate with the most support, I, I would welcome a discussion about alternative processes like rank choice voting. Um, but with less than seven months until the election and five council candidates uh, having already announced and are actively campaigning, uh, and with two of you likely also running again, it feels like this is maybe a discussion that should have happened months ago. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Welcome. Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> all, great, all great points there. Um, I guess the, the one thing that I wanted to say is uh, we struggle enough with getting people to vote in the, in the normal election, especially when it's a non-mayoral municipal election. We certainly get a, have a horrible time of getting anybody to show up for a school board election. Um, I mean, the winner of the school board election this last time spent $6.50 per vote. That tells you how many few people showed up to vote. So instead of spending $80,000 on a, on, a, on a runoff election, um, you know, for a $17,000 a year part-time job, uh, maybe we should spend that money on educating people where to vote, more precincts, more election workers, uh, sending out postcards telling people when the election is and why it's important to vote. Maybe we should have all the counselors participate in making a video telling them why they think it's important to vote. Well, way better spent money than this. I feel that this amendment is just vindictive government, and that's awful. Thank you. Welcome. Tim Stanga, I just heard about this today, and it's just it really and truthfully, the public that's watching this today, really it shouldn't surprise them. It's the last hurrah. First, they wanted to get rid of public input. The same people that are pushing for 50.1%. Same people. And the sad part about it is they have money to be able to run an effective election. Anybody that wants to run for city council should have the right to. But it shouldn't cost an arm and a leg to get elected at a seventeen dollars to $18,000 job. What this is, is this, this is a black eye in the people that are bringing this up because their candidate did not get voted in. And they're still sour. And it's pretty sad that we have to put a black eye and sour in front of the good people of Sioux Falls and we have to take advantage of them. There's people out here that love to run for city council, but they don't have the money to do it. And they're not gonna go out and beg people to do it. 
But there are people that, there's several people that in Sioux Falls that aren't afraid to give money to them because they want them on the city council for one reason and one reason only. They want their agenda put through so their pockets are getting bigger. And then once you get out of city government, don't worry, we will take care of you because that's the way politics is. I'm tired of paying for what goes on in, in city government. I'm tired of what, and each state government's the same, federal government's the same. It's time to drain the swamp. Time to get rid of the corruption because this government in Sioux Falls is one of the corrupt, most corrupt governments I've ever seen. What has gone on in this city council within the last eight years is really pathetic. And the sad part about it is the citizens of Sioux Falls see it. Because when I go out and I talk to people, they know who the rubber stampers are, and they know where they stand for. They stand on the mayor's side, and it's very proven. But the mayor doesn't like it when you get a city councilor that wants to ask questions, because you're supposed to be a sheep. You're just supposed to go right along with it. I'll tell you what, people are tired of sheep. People want to have questions asked, they want questions answered but they also want the truth. But I'm hoping that the next mayor that is elected, if this does pass, the next mayor that is elected overturns if this thing goes through. Thank you. Council, I'm gonna leave it in your hands. Uh, uh, Councilor uh, Rolfing. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to offer an amendment to this. Uh, Par pardon me, Mr. Mayor. There yes, I'm, thank you, I've got it. Say that again? Oh yes, I'm sorry. I would move uh, to approve this. Uh, Thank you. Councilor uh, Rolfing has made a motion to approve uh, this particular ordinance. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. There is a second. Uh, Councilor uh, Rolfing. Yes, thank you. You're um, welcome. I don't even know where to start with the garbage that just went on here, accusing us of being taking on, um, taking bribes and uh, uh, getting more money when we leave and uh, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, uh, it, it, just, it just sickens me. I got into this position because I wanted to do what was right for Sioux Falls. The night in 2010 I was elected, I realized I wasn't gonna elect, gonna, gonna, going to get elected by over 50% and I felt sick. I didn't really feel like I was elected. Never have until 2014 when I was elected by 65%. Somebody out there thought, some of us were doing a pretty good job. Moving the city along, doing things that need to be done, and keeping it moving. I apologize if some people think that I made money at this. I didn't. I haven't. This has been a labor of love. And I think a labor of love that can move things better by having each individual candidate being elected by a 50% 50, 50 plus one. So in that light, I would like to add, uh, I move that to amend section eight to delete parts A and B and replacing them with the following. All elections by majority. In all elections for elective office within the city, including at-large council members and district council members and mayor, if no candidate in a race involving three or more candidates receive a majority of the votes cast for, for that particular elective office, a runoff election shall be held three weeks from the date of the first election. At the runoff election, the two candidates receiving the highest number of votes for the first election shall be on the ballot. However, if there is a tie for second place in the first election and there is no tie for first place, all tying second place candidates shall be placed along with their first place candidate on a ballot for a runoff election. The runoff election shall be held at the same polling places and shall be conducted, returned, and canvassed in the same manner as the first election. The person receiving the highest number of votes at the runoff election is elected. Second the amendment. There has uh, been a motion to amend uh, this particular ordinance. Uh, I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Uh, Council, you all have, all have a, a copy, and that has been seconded. 
Uh, Councilor Rolfing, before I go to your colleagues, any, any additional comments on this? Yeah, I would. Thank you. I have, I have a number of comments, and I, I appreciate everybody thinking this thing through and, and working with it. Um, I just don't see it as a tough one. Um, the, the money, people are, if the people are going to run, having one extra uh, or two, three extra weeks of, of election is not as much of a, time, of a money commitment as it is a time commitment. It's out knocking on doors. It's going to every one of the places that need to be, need, that you need to go to make your uh, presence felt. It's going to the debates. It's, you know, we had people that don't even show up for debates, candidates. And that's, that's, just, that's just wrong. It doesn't say that they're in it for the right reasons. The, scat, the status quo requires a plurality vote now, meaning 34% or more. You know, they moved that up from a straight plurality because they thought that maybe 20% wouldn't be good. So I'm just saying from 34 to 50. And that means that uh, that could win an election with only 34% of the vote. But it fails to recognize that there could be 66% of the public vote that was against that candidate, or at least not for that candidate. How can you... Um, the, the cost of another election is not a problem. The problem that's, uh, is the plurality of citizens that don't have... A plurality does not have the final decision on, what, on who's going to represent them. This is not about candidates um, or the elitist taking over. It's about our citizens having a final say on who represents them. This amendment will bring parity between the mayor and the council. Two candidates running for the same office have a better chance to define themselves and their platforms than they do with five or six or three or four. Getting it down to two, you have a chance to really determine which one of those two you really want and what platform you're, you're voting for. Since 2000, just to give you an, uh, an example, a majority election of the council would have resulted in only one additional runoff election that wasn't held already. Cost is not a, is not a consideration here, as a single council runoffs are infrequent and are always budgeted for. It's a cost of democracy. A runoff will provide for voting public, the voting public, with the opportunity to direct, directly compare the two top candidates and make the final decision on who will re represent them. And let me assure you, there have been no special interest in the involvement of this. I've been thinking about this since that day I was first elected to this council. Mr. Paulson and I, and I use his name lovingly, I've known John for 40 plus years. He's a good man, and he does not deserve to be dragged under the table like that. There are no special interests in this. When I was, um, I, as I said, when I opened up, I'm here to do what I think and what the voters think is right for the city of Sioux Falls, and I think this is what it is. So I would appreciate your support on this issue. Councilor Mutt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Um, Thank you, too, for those folks who have thought this through and had constructive comments. I want you to think about the math involved in a 34% vote win. That means 66% of the people voted against you, and you won anyway? And that has, uh, you can call it whatever you want in terms of when this is coming to public, but that has bothered me from the day that it passed. 66% of the people voted against you but you won the seat anyway. Congratulations, I think. I really struggle with this. I really am at a point where this city council, I don't care that we don't make as much money as the mayor and I don't care that we don't have the same amount of power. The city council has a lot to do with a huge budget. It has a lot to do with everything that happens in this community on a day-to-day -day basis and if we can't get 50 plus 1 percent of the vote to elect the people that sit in these important chairs, I'm worried about what happens to this government then. And then I would speak directly to my, to my uh, colleague, Councillor Staley, and remind her that in 2010 I didn't make 50 percent of the vote. I had 48 point something. If we had had a runoff, that whole 2010 election may have ended differently. And I would like those citizens who voted in those elections where that vote is split in that way, it was split by four people. 
why do those folks who voted for the two people that were votes three and four, why do they not get to say, have a say in the final vote? I don't understand that kind of thinking. It isn't about power, it isn't about money. And I want you to also think then historically about this community and think about who are the people that are most likely to win these races for these city council. They're the ones that work the hardest. You look at Councillor Kermit Staggers and you think about how much money he did not spend on these election campaigns and you think about how much time he spent knocking on doors. How much time he spent going door to door and speaking one on one with people. He didn't spend money, he worked hard and that's how he got here. And I would tell you that's exactly how Councillor Staley got here as well. She didn't spend money to get to this seat. She has worked really hard. And that is what campaigning is about. It is not about how much money you spend. It is about how much you care about this community and how hard you work to campaign. And if it's okay with you to have 66% of the people vote against you, then go ahead and, and turn this one down. But this one matters to the people who vote. I ask for your support. Thank you. Uh, Council Chair Kiley. Thank you. An election that is based on plurality, our current system, in my opinion, looks out for the good of the candidate. Let's instead look at the citizens, the individuals that take the time to cast their votes. Why is 34% the magic number? Why not 35% or 25% for that matter? The status quo, 34% allows the candidate to win a council election as Councilor uh, Erpenbach and Rolfing have already stated, um, even though 66% of the individuals voted against them. The biggest point for me is, shouldn't the aim of any election be to gauge the will of the majority? The will of the majority of the individuals that took the time to cast their vote. Opponents use examples of the legislature here in South Dakota, the governor, the county commissioner elections to bolster their argument against this amendment. It needs to be pointed out, however, that these elected officials are elected using the party system. In fact, they have to compete in two races, a primary and a general election. Furthermore, there's been a lot stated about deep pockets and elitists. I will remind you that the top two fundraisers in the last municipal election actually lost their election. And it also occurred in a very notable, very notable election in 2012 involving council members. It is also not factual to say that voter turnout declines in a runoff election in fact, the, the last time a runoff took place in 2010, voter turnout actually saw more voters than the initial election. Again, more votes cast in the runoff than in the initial election. If the majority requirement had been in place, as Councilor Rolfing stated in 2000, the city would have only required have, to hold one additional runoff election. That's one additional election in the last nine elections. As I stated earlier, let's look out for the citizens. Let's look out for the voters. What it comes down to me is shouldn't the aim of any election be to gauge the will of the majority? 34% or any other arbitrary number below 50% plus one does not represent majority of the individuals that, uh, that took the time to cast their vote. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Uh, Councilor Neisser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. The first thing I want to say is my opposition to this is, is in principle. I don't question the motives of those who made the motion and uh, I, it's too bad it kind of devolved the way it did. So hopefully we can stick to civil <coughs> discourse. Um, so to me, the idea seems logical. I mean, I heard it out, but the study of the data shows it is problematic and it is a solution looking for a problem. 
Most council races have clear winners historically. Very few are razor thin margins. We already require 34%, which is more than a simple plurality. And for me, that, that requirement provides a firewall against a fringe candidate. So if you have maybe eight candidates in the race, you don't have you know, a, a fracturing of the votes and somebody you know, sli slips in with 12%. Uh, most elections nationwide are simple plurality. Um, I, let's just personalize it for me. I was elected with 48% of the vote with four candidates. Is, am I illegitimate? I mean, I don't think so. I, I think I, 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 I don't, I'm not ashamed of that. I, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, the next thing is the mayor and the council, they're not the same and for a few reasons. The mayor is perceived differently. Look at the turnout. It's, it's substantially higher. Um, if you look at, at mayoral elections and then you look at the undervotes for at large, you'll see thousands of people who fill in the box for mayor and they don't even bother to fill in that next box for a counselor. There's, the mayor is a strong mayor. To me, one bad mayor is, is a disaster. One bad counselor, an annoyance, a nuisance. I'm not trying to minimize our job. I'm just saying the mayor runs the city. There, there is a difference. There's substantially less turnout in the, in the off years where I ran, for example. The turnout was very, very low. If we had a runoff, I can't even imagine what the turnout would be if it was just a council. I mean, I look at the school board. I, it's sad. I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. Very few people are going to show up for a runoff. And as an example, let's say 2,000 people vote um, in the first election. And somebody gets 45% of the vote. And then in the second election, 1,500 or 1,000 show up and they get 65% of the vote. How did that any, add any more legitimacy to their election? I, 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 just, I just don't see it. So if we took, take a look at the undervotes in the mayoral election years, you will see, and there's a chart on the next page, look, look at the number of undervotes. That, that just goes to, to point out how many people just don't fill the box. So I'm, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that I see the people will turn out for a, a mayoral runoff. I'm not so sure they're going to show up for a council runoff. And then the turnout differences. Again, you can see the, the turnout. And I do want to, the turnout is much lower. I do want to address the mayoral runoff in 2010. Looking back over the last 20 years and looking at other jurisdictions, uh, runoffs are very, very low turnout. This was an exception, and I think those of you who can think back to history know why. The person who was running against, the two candidates running, there was one, the run running against our current mayor, there was a lot of people who were, I'm just going to say it, who were kind of freaking out about the idea of that person becoming mayor, and there was a lot of turnout. It was higher than, it, than the first election, and th but that was an anomaly. I'll just say that if you look at all of the, if you look at our turnout elections in other jurisdictions, they're pitiful. So as an example, the off-year council runoff um, in 2000, the first election there's a 15% turnout, in the runoff there's a 10% turnout. A third of the people that showed up in the first one didn't bother to show up in the second one. As I said, how does that uh, add any clar clarity or legitimacy to the first election? It, to me, if we were going to change this, it should be done in a deliberate fashion. We should have a discussion about it. We need to define if there's a problem, look at the pros and cons. Look at, there's a lot of ways to vote. I mean, uh, somebody pointed out that you could do instant runoff voting and rank voting. We could research what other jurisdictions have done. It should, really should be at a committee and not just tagged on to an amendment, uh, an amendment to an otherwise mundane ordinance. Uh, races are already meaningful. Elections where the candidate wins with less than 50% of the vote are meaningful. They happen every, at every level, every year. No one questions the legitimacy of those candidates. With a 34% floor, once again, you're going to have to get a decent, substantial cross-section of the electorate with three or more candidates on the ballot. Getting 50% of the vote in a substantially lower turnout election, to me, I, I don't necessarily see the benefit. So the conclusion I get to is more runoff elections will cost the taxpayer more money and candidates more money, all candidates. I'm not going to make this a rich versus poor. It's just going to drive up the cost of elections. And if you don't think we're going to have to send out more postcards and spend more money and you're just going to knock on doors, it's, it's just fantasy. Knocking on doors is the number one thing you can do, but you're going to have to do bulk mail or something. Runoff elections promote voter fatigue. They make the election cycles longer. People don't want to go through elections even longer and longer, and then they're going to have a school board a couple weeks later. 
runoff elect run elections are low turnout for council elections, so we can see that. There is no problem. We already require 34%. That's more than a plurality. So in the end, voter turnout will not increase. Campaign costs will increase. Taxpayers will pay more. Election cycles will increase. And in most cases, the results won't change. Vote no on this unnecessary amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. I think the first thing that we all have to do that's most important is to kind of take ourselves and our own futures out of this equation and make sure we're voting on what's best for the city. And I know that that part hasn't been easy. We can say it. We're all doing that. I would hope we are. Um, the idea behind this is to set the goal a little higher uh, for somebody to win a seat. And the goal of the elections is to find our best candidates. So it's, it's a noble idea um, to address a couple of the things that have come up. I've never bought that it's a have versus have nots argument as far as who's going to win office. I, I agree what's already been said. I won't go through all of it, but it does come down to most of it. You do have to raise funds, but you do have to knock on doors, get the signs out, go to the programs you're invited to, to the forums. Um, you have invitations to certain groups, and there's lots of them out there. And I think any candidate with a good message in this town is going to get the word out. And I think we've seen from recent examples, we've seen a number of candidates and officials who are very good and effective at working through the media to get their message out, both local media and social. So I think folks get their word out without spending money. So I don't necessarily buy the Rockefeller issue that some people just won't be able to run. I do agree with one thing I heard on the six to $10,000 probably range to run for council. If you were to have a runoff and go another three weeks, I don't doubt you'd have to have another mailer or something to that effect and maybe spend, I'll just take a guesstimate at a thousand, but I can tell you that my personal goal would be to go back to the boxes, the brochures I hadn't handed out yet and take them to the doors I haven't knocked on yet. So I do think it comes down to a lot of the working it out. There is a good point brought out by Councillor Neitzert as far as the turnout for these elections. Um, but I think what we're doing here is we're, we're just kind of really tearing down the council in general, like we're, well, we're not as important as the mayor. And the mayor's a whole different level. You know, this is the legislative branch of our government. This is the checks and balances. This is, uh, we come here every week to work with him and hold the purse strings on the budget and do what we do. So, well, yes, off your elections are down. They're down locally. They are down nationally. That's just the way it goes. Doesn't make the people involved in government or who are running any less important and the job they do any less important. So I guess where I lean, and this is our weekly cliffhanger, it seems every week we've got something where, which, what are we doing this week? But it leans this way to me. Um, to vote this through is gonna make a challenge for probably all of us and anybody else who's thinking of seeking office in the future. But I mean, to me, it's my belief that any candidate worth serving Sioux Falls is going to be up to that challenge. So I appreciate all the arguments again, but that's the way I'm leaning right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Silver. Councillor uh, Vice Chair Erickson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just a couple things I want to address that, um, with maybe some of the comments that um, were made. I don't generally respond to that, but um, I felt I got a little personal tonight, more than usual, and that's unfortunate, um, because I don't think that this is for your friend. I don't think this is against a particular counselor. I don't think this is against any person sitting here. It's not personal. It's just your policy idea, your, a few policy ideas that feel this way, and that's okay. That's democracy. That's why we sit here. That's why we vote. I've never felt that I can't ask Mr. Mayor, you a question, or any of your staff. You might not like my questions and vice versa, and that's okay because that's a good policy discussion. You at no time have ever said to me, Counselor, you can't ask this question. You've never made me feel that way. And I just want to clear that as well because I think it's really unfortunate that it steers that way. Um, one of the points I want to make, though, is let's not forget that there's a standard in place. We're not talking about 17 let me make it more realistic. We're not talking about five candidates, and I just need to get one more vote than the next person. There is a standard, and 34% is nothing to, to shake a stick at. This is, I mean, this, this is tough. This is, I mean, I had the luxury when I ran to go head to head. And so for me, I knew I did not have the threat 
over me of, of a runoff, which did not scare me. I thought about it. I thought, oh, okay, well, I need to budget for it if I'm going to have that. But it didn't scare me off. It didn't make me feel as if I wasn't going to run. It didn't uh, make me really change my strategy other than once all the candidates were filed, I needed to budget my money appropriately to make sure that that was the case. But it never scared me off. I ran at large, so I would say my amount I needed to raise was a substantial amount more for me personally. Now, other candidates did not, um, but I felt for me I needed to, to raise that higher, higher amount. Um, I also was elected with the party system as well as council, and so I've walked through both of those. I unfortunately or fortunately had a, um, a primary, um, which helped me get name recognition, I feel. But I had that where I only had to be one of two uh, out of four people running. The next time there was four more people running, I had to be one of two for that. And so my goal was much different with this. Um, I think it's really hard to compare um, those elections because it's, it's different when you have, um, uh, you know, that behind your name, uh, you know, it just changes the elections. Um, I will say for me personally, I feel like the mayor seat is different. Uh, the role of that, we, we serve in a mayor strong government. It's just what it is. It's what was changed. We're not commission style. We aren't run like county commission um, or really the legislature. And I don't want to diminish how their elections are held either because I think that it's very worthy. Um, but I do recognize that the mayor's position is different. They hold different authority than we do. They do, it is what it is. And I admire that position and I think that it is not maybe more important, but it should be at a different standard. And so I do support that. But I'm having a hard time supporting uh, uh, the 50 plus one because there is a standard in place. It's not a simple plus one more than the next guy or gal. It is a standard in place, and I'm okay with that. So I, unfortunately, uh, for some, will not be supporting that amendment. Councilor Sealy. We'll start with the names, please. Um, we have used the plurality form of government since the implementation of this new form, the strong mayor form of government. And I wanted to read the names of the faithful servants through the years who served who did not get 51% of the vote. Casey Marshall, Mary Glensky, Rib Billsby, Curtis Rust, Kevin Cavanaugh, Andy Howes, D. Knutson, and again, D. Knutson, a two times. She got 36%, 39%. Rex Ralfing, Michelle Erpenbach, Teresa Staley, Greg Neitzert, and Pat Starr. Now, as an observer in the city government uh, through these past years, I have had great respect for these individuals, and I believe that they served as effectively as any other member of the council who got 51%. In fact, I have never, ever heard our community raise this as an issue and say that these people are less than the other council members. Uh, this, in fact, the first time I ever heard about this was two weeks ago when Rex Ralfing called me and said he was proposing this. I had never heard it before. I had a personal involvement in 2010 with this with Councilor Erpenbach, as she brought up. She got 49% of the vote in a four-person race. And I have never heard anybody say that she wasn't qualified she rose to leadership within our council. She's been respected. I've never heard anyone diminish her in any way because she didn't get 51% of the vote. Dee Knudsen, the same thing. So to me, this is rather insulting to those people who have served in the past. And it's also somewhat insulting to the three of us who just ran and didn't get 51% of the vote. Councilor uh, Rolfing told me when he called that he felt sick back when he was elected with 45% of the vote. And Councilor Erpenbach has just indicated that almost eight years ago she also felt very badly about this. And I, I would raise the question, why didn't you bring this up right after you were elected? Why have you waited until you're on your way out 
You've enjoyed that first term. You enjoyed your second term as an incumbent. And now on your way out, we're, we're putting this out there. And so that it takes away that opportunity from other people to have that same experience with getting 46%, whatever. I agree with Councilor Erickson. We already have a mandate in place of the 35%, 34%. It's worked. It's worked for our community. And again, I, I think we're setting a precedent here to say that the, uh, in the past, the people we've elected have, have been somewhat inferior. And I, I will not go along with that. Again, I think it's a slap in the face. Now, let me also say that, and I know we've, we've talked about these other um, offices that would may, maybe be um, partisan. The school board is not partisan. County commissioners, the Sioux Falls City Council, our state legislators, governors, U.S. Congress, they're all elected by plurality. They don't have that majority threshold even after you have the uh, primary. And I, Councilor Ralphing also said to me that he feels that we need to have the same standard as our mayor. So I'm going to be promo um, proposing a substitute em a motion. This is my substitute motion. I would like to make a substitute motion to amend Section 8 by deleting parts A and B and replacing it with the following. All elections, in all elections for elective office within the city, including at-large council members and district council members and the mayor, the person receiving the highest number of votes for that office is elected to that office. If no candidate receives 34% of the votes cast in that race, then the top two candidates shall be required to participate in a runoff election, which shall be held three weeks from the date of the first election. At the runoff election, the two candidates receiving the highest number of votes at the first election shall be on the ballot. However, if there is a tie for second place in the first election and there is no tie for first place, all tying second place candidates shall be placed along with the first place candidate on the ballot for the runoff election. The runoff election shall be ha held at the same polling places and shall be conducted, returned, and canvassed in the same manner as the first election. The person receiving the highest number of votes at the runoff election is elected. So that is my motion. Second, Star. Councilor Saley, did you want to explain your amendment? Well, I think I, yes, I explained that Councilor Ralphing wants to make our level playing field between the mayors being elected by, and, and the council. So I'm saying plurality is a really, a, I think, a very positive thing for our community. It's worked well with our city council members. So let's move this into the mayor's race as well. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Kylie? No. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? No. Selberg? Starr? Yes. Well, that has failed three to five. Um, Council, we've had really good discussion on this topic. Uh, some of it has been repetitive near the end. Uh, I would highly recommend we vote on the uh, proposed amendment. Um, Councilor Chair uh, Kiley? I will not be repetitive. Okay. There's been just, we just had the discussion about actually lowering the bar for the mayoral election. What we've been discussing previously for councilors is actually raising the bar. As an educator for 33 years, I stray, strive to raise the bar every day in my classrooms. I strive to get the students to think beyond what they thought was possible for themselves. I was also encouraged by my administrators to raise the bar. And I strongly feel that our efforts, our combined efforts administratively as well as individual teachers to raise the bar paid off uh, in students that were prepared to be good citizens and to contribute to society. So for that reason, I don't see what is wrong with raising the bar 
for the counselors. Because uh, 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 we are about to embark on authorizing a nearly one half billion dollar budget for the city. Now, if that's not an important role, then I don't know what is. Thank you. Hey, roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley. And we're, we're voting on the amendment, just for some yeah. clarification. So, yes. yes. No. Oh, yeah. No. Thank you. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? No. Mayor votes yes. That is passed five to four. Item six. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's an amendment. Yeah, it's an amended, a amended main motion. Uh, actually, it's an amendment to the ordinance. Um, Council, any further discussion? A roll call vote, please, on the, uh, the ordinance as amended. Council Member Staley? No. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? No. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Star. No. That is passed five to three. Now item six. Thank you, Council. First reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing appropriations authorizing an increase in property tax revenue pursuant to SDCL 10-13-15 and the means of financing for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2018. Tracy. Tracy Turback with the Finance Office. Uh, item number six is the first reading of the budget ordinance for 2018. The budget ordinance does really two things. First, it establishes the appropriations for the 2018 budget for the 11 governmental, or what we often refer to as budgeted funds. The total appropriated budget for those 11 funds is about 280.7 million. The largest among those is the general fund and the budget for the general fund as proposed is 161.5 million. The second thing this ordinance will do is establish the property tax levy, which provides funding for the 2018 general fund budget. The estimated levy amount is $60.3 million, and that amount does include an inflationary adjustment this year of 1% as allowed by state law. And I would ask for the council to set the data hearing and move this ordinance forward to Second reading on September 19th. So moved, Rolfing. Council, maybe second that. Second, Selberg. Thank you, Councilor Selberg. There's been a motion to set a date of hearing. Second reading for September 19th for this particular ordinance. Um, if no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed. to zero. Thank you. Item 10. Public hearing for the public input for a resolution adopting the budget for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2018, and the 2018-2022 capital program. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak uh, to this particular topic? I'll ask uh, one more time. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this particular topic? Thank you very much. Item number seven. First reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the city authorizing the issuance of its sales tax revenue bonds, authorizing the use of the proceeds thereof to refund the outstanding city of Sioux Falls sales tax revenue bond series 2007A-1 and to pay the cost of issuance thereof and pledging a portion of the sales and use tax proceeds of the city to the payment of said sales tax revenue bonds, fixing the terms of such sales tax revenue bonds, authorizing the execution and delivery of a supplemental indenture to an amended and restated indenture of trust between the city and the First National Bank in Sioux Falls, and authorizing the sale, execution, and delivery of such sales tax revenue bonds in an amount sufficient together with funds on hand one, to fund a deposit to a Series 2007A-1 escrow fund to redeem the Series 2007A-1 bonds. Two, to pay costs of issuance of such Series 2017 bonds. And three, to fund capitalized interest, if any, in a debt service reserve fund. Thank you.
Tracy, good evening. Thank you, Denise, for reading that. I'm glad I don't have to do that. Um, this ordinance is about taking advantage of an opportunity to refund some of the city's out, outstanding sales tax bonds. Uh, it is a very exciting opportunity for the city and for our water customers. Uh, I won't take you through all the slides that I did this afternoon, but I do, uh, for the benefit of the, the public, I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, tell, telling uh, those folks uh, kind of what this is about. The proposed refunding transaction will result in very significant savings to the water fund. It will immediately reduce the amount of the outstanding debt of our water department, and it will pay off the balance of the Lewis and Clark bonds 10 years earlier than originally expected. And for those who maybe don't know what a bond refunding is, uh, it, it's a really relatively simple concept. We sell new bonds, take the money from the new bonds to pay off the old bonds. That results uh, because the new bonds carry a lower interest rate than the old bonds. That resu results in interest savings to the city. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, the, the old bonds that we're talking about uh, are the, were issued in 2007. And uh, that was when the city issued $70 million in sales tax revenue bonds to pay for the city's contribution to the Lewis and Clark Water Project. They were originally issued as 30-year bonds, which means it would take us 30 years uh, from 2007 or 2036 to uh, pay those bonds off. Payments uh, on those bonds have been made from water user fees. Uh, we are approaching the early call date that was uh, established when those bonds were initially sold. That, is in, that early call date is in November of 2017. Uh, as of today, there are $62.6 million remaining of that original $70 million uh, dollar issuance. Uh, that remain outstanding. The new bonds that we're proposing uh, would raise money and in combination with cash from the Water Enterprise Fund would pay off the outstanding bonds, that $62.6 .6 million. And the interest savings from this transaction will be incredible. Uh, the estimated net reduction of debt service payments uh, would net out to $25.2 million. In today's dollars, uh, by uh, present value savings analysis, the savings would be $14.4 million. That's in today's dollars. The new bonds uh, would be paid off in nine years, which is 10 years earlier uh, than if we choose not to proceed with this refunding transaction and simply continue paying on the original bond issue. The Water Enterprise Fund, uh, if we do execute this transaction, would be debt free, in other words, in nine years rather than 19 years. So I do want to, uh, for those that, that uh, maybe get lost in numbers a little bit, uh, this graphic really compares the debt service payments, principal and interest of the uh, old bonds, which are represented by the blue bars, with the uh, principal and interest payments of what would be our new bonds. So you can see, uh, without really uh, trying to do any addition based on the graphic, you can see quite clearly that there uh, are a lot of payments that we would avoid through this process. And if you add up all those dollars uh, and, and net it out against the cash that we're going to put into this, as I say, it would be savings in excess of $25 million or over $14 million uh, in today's, today's dollars. So that, uh, and again, I, I think what the other thing that jumps out uh, from this graphic uh, is the point I made about paying those bonds off 10 years, 10 years sooner than what we had originally anticipated. So. Uh, the new bond issue would be paid off in 2026, whereas the old ones would not be paid until 2036 if we did not do this refinancing. So the ordinance uh, that, that is on first reading tonight would authorize the issuance of those new bonds. It would set the, the parameters for the bond amount, the interest rate, and the final maturity, and would establish the use of the bond proceeds. Uh, the, those uses would be, as I said, to pay off the uh, the uh, old outstanding bonds. It would also cover the cost of issuance of the new bonds, funded debt service reserve, and any capitalized interest on the new bonds. Uh, I would ask for the council approval, setting the date of hearing and second reading for September 19th. Tracy, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, council, any questions or motions? Move to approve Rolfing. Second, that, Selberg. Thank you, uh, Councilor Selberg. I'm sorry, Councilor Rolfing and Councilor Selberg would like to set that date of hearing. Uh, if there is any, if there is no discussion, any roll call, please. 
Council members Daly? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. With that, it's passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Item 8. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, declaring certain real property of the city surplus and approving offer to purchase. Well, good evening, City Council. Darren Ketchum with the City of Sioux Falls Community Development Office. Um, <clears throat> tough to follow that up, saving $25 million, but we do have an equally exciting announcement uh, that you've heard about, and so this is kind of kicking that, that project off with the official council consideration. This is the offer to purchase real estate. First, we have to declare it surplus, so this is the first reading of that um, ordinance. The presentation that I'm going to talk about is focused on that offer to purchase of that real estate. Uh, Brent O'Neill, our local uh, in-house TIF expert, will be up to talk more in detail about the TIF following me, but our entire team is here to, to talk with you and answer questions this evening. I'd like to just thank uh, many of the city employees that have worked on this project uh, for the last several months uh, from you know, many of the city departments, public works, planning, economic development, um, finance. So we just, we've truly had a great uh, team effort. And I'd also like to thank Lloyd Companies for the vision they've shown in our community and the continued investment that they've demonstrated over the years. Next slide. So council, this is the process that we use to get to this point. Uh, we've done a request for proposals in the spring of 2017 where we received five proposals, um, four of them from local companies. A fifth one was from a firm from Chicago that did partner with uh, a local company here. So we did uh, have very good response to this proposal. Um, we have a selection committee comprised of uh, myself, um, Tracy Turback, Mike Cooper, Dustin Powers, and Councillor Erickson. As we went through these proposals, uh, they were obviously ranked by each of these individuals on their own, uh, and then we had uh, some presentations that we took into consideration. The Lloyd Company's proposal was unanimously uh, identified as the number one proposal by all of the selection committee members. Over the past uh, few months, we've worked to complete the project negotiations, um, and we've went to the Planning Commission for the initial uh, piece uh, last Wednesday. Uh, we were here with you for an informational last week. A uh, week prior to that, we spent some time with the Minnehaha County Commission and presented the project to them as well. Next slide. So here is the, the, the proposal that we're talking about largely on the city-owned property up uh, towards the intersection of 2nd and Phillips. Uh, this is what we would term building A, and this is built on, on the city property. When I show the site plan in a following slide, you'll see um, here, you can go to that slide right now. You can see there is a building B. Uh, building B is located on, on private property that had been acquired by Lloyd Companies. And so when we talk about this offer to purchase, the conditions that are identified in this offer to purchase are largely related to building A. However, we did tie them to the development agreement that you would consider as part of the, the TIF process. The uh, development agreement does tie the conditions um, for completion to the developer in terms of time, in terms of the quality of the product, uh, the square footage, the number of units. Basically, we're gonna go through, and this is what you, you said you would build. This is the, the renderings that you've showed us. We've put that into a, a narrative and, and a legal agreement that we can you know, both have uh, the same expectation for what this will look like when we get to the, the end of the day. Go to the next slide. So here is the project description, a little more narrative, and I've bolded building A just to draw to your attention. This is really what the focus of the offer to purchase is centered around. Uh, we're talking about a five-story building, approximately 118,000 square feet of residential space, 18,000 square feet of commercial space. Uh, in that, you'll have upwards of 129 apartment units. Building B is a four-story structure with uh, 66,000 square feet and about 75, 74 apartments. All of this space, uh, it's more than just a building. It comes with some great amenities that complement our beautiful Falls Park West. It adds additional on-street parking. 
And one of the greatest things about this development is it doesn't rely on the city to provide all of the parking necessary to support the increased density of this development. Through this, the developer has incorporated 260 underground parking spaces that'll be utilized by the tenants of the apartments and by the uh, commercial space tenants. And the, one of the greatest things about this, this is, a, this is no small project. This is no small investment. This is a $43.5 million investment in the heart of our city. $43.5 million that will complement our Falls Park West It'll complement our Levitt Pavilion, and it'll spur additional development in that area that's been slow to grow over the past decade. Right. So this is the, some of the items that you would see in the offer to purchase. That purchase price, we had an, an appraisal completed by Elwood and Martin in the summer um, of 2017, and the appraised value was $875,000, and that is the purchase price that we agreed to. So the city will be getting the fully appraised value for this property. The conditions are tied to not only the building on the city's property, but also to the redevelopment of the blighted and contaminated property to the west of the city-owned property. Uh, the, the items that I think are really important is we, we don't want to just have a property transaction and then nothing happen. And so we've put stipulations in this agreement that establish, a, I think, a fairly aggressive yet responsible timeline that the developer has to co commence construction by June 1st of 2018 on Building A. And they have to complete that structure uh, by November 1st, 2019. Um, additionally, should something not go as planned, uh, the city does have a mechanism included in this agreement to, to get that uh, property back into the city's uh, possession at a predetermined repurchase price of $787,000. Our goal is to get this development done and we have the highest confidence that this project will be completed uh, on time and as designed. With all that confidence, we still put in these protections to protect the taxpayer to ensure that we are getting what, uh, what has been proposed. So the next steps, we would ask you to set uh, the second reading for this item for September 19th and come back again that evening to, to talk about this and for your final consideration. Um, certainly, it would be open to any questions. Um, Darren, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Councilor Neisser, sir. I'll move to set the second reading to Tuesday, September 19th. Second. Thank you. Uh, there has been a, a motion to set the data hearing and second reading for this uh, uh, ordinance. If there, yes, Councilor Starr, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Director, I, my question is I don't see the supporting documents, at least online, the appraisal, the purchase agreement, um, you know, some of those supporting documents that go with us. You gave us the, but well, you're asking us to approve the, the purchase agreement and the, the sale of the property, but the, the contract isn't there and the, the other supporting documents. Will they be there for the second reading? I believe they're there currently, Councilor. Yes, uh, you just need to scroll. They're all attached to, to the see. item. Yep. All right. Yep. Thank you. I'm good. Do you have a motion? Hey, roll call, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. And that's past 8 to 0, item 9. First reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, establishing the tax increment revenues to be collected and authorizing the payment of tax increment revenues to C.R. Lloyd Associates, Inc. in accordance with the development agreement for tax incremental district number 21, city of Sioux Falls. Good evening, Brent O'Neill, uh, community development, here to talk about uh, kind of that other strong component we'll ask you to look at on the 19th. I'm going to uh, give you a few pieces of information on TIF. I maybe would. Um, uh, you mind helping me, Dustin? Um, uh, just kind of reset uh, what we're going to be looking at on the 19th as far as the TIF piece of this goes. As Darren said, the, the land purchase is tied to the TIF, as is a, a couple other things that uh, Lloyd uh, is bringing together on this project. Uh, the project boundary is going to be brought to you by resolution, and that is simply uh, taking the geographic parameters and saying this is what uh, uh, the TIF district is comprised of, and then it also formally sets and creates 
the TIF district. The project plan is also going to be brought to you by resolution, and that is a, a more of a detailed outline of how the TIF is intended to function, how it's intended to operate. Uh, those are both uh, statutory requirements, so there'll be quite a few things uh, in those that uh, uh, tie back to statute. And then the third, and that's the first reading tonight, is a development agreement, and that's really the bind uh, uh, once the TIF uh, plan and TIF boundary are approved that really uh, create the engagement between the city and the developer on this TIF that specifically outlines what the commitments are by each party to see this TIF through to fruition. And again, uh, we're going to ask the council to look at those as a package on September 19th. Uh, Darren, give you a little bit of an overview of kind of the project site. Uh, this is going to be the boundary that we'll bring to you on the 19th. It includes the entire site as well as that southwest parcel, the one that says 27672. That is Ransom Church. They're aware of this, are actually very excited about it and are happy to be included in the district. And then you'll see that uh, in addition to the property lines, we've included the right of way around this project. I'll get into a little more detail there, but in a nutshell, uh, this project will involve work within the right of way. So that's why uh, we've included that. I wanna take just a, a minute to reset a little bit about uh, how we as staff uh, come forward to the council whenever there's a TIF application and the criteria. Uh, that we're going to look at. We're ultimately trying to get if TIF uh, supportable on a project and at what level. So there are uh, three uh, criteria. Uh, sometimes uh, we talk about kind of a fourth criteria, which is a little more of a, a subjective, uh, uh, conditional type thing. But the three that we feel at the staff level we need to bring uh, to you start with necessity, and this is the financial necessity. Is there a gap in the project? Would the project not go forward but for the TIF uh, being in place? So that's one evaluation we're going to look at. Two, if funds are used for TIF, how are those funds anticipated to be used in the project? So those are the use of funds. Are, are those funds used for a standard uh, uh, that the city policy or, or city uh, precedent has set in the past and does it comply with state statute? And then the third is the significance and impact uh, to the project and the community. Is a project you know, something that moves a needle and, and uh, uh, warrants justifying an incentive of this nature? Uh, that ultimately, again, gets us to uh, is TIF supported and at what level? And really, at, at our levels, we're going to bring an affirmative recommendation forward. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, either fully or in part, all three of those tests have to be passed. And as we're bringing a, a positive recommendation on this forward, uh, we do uh, believe those tests have been met. I am going to go through those uh, real quickly, one slide each in reverse order here, of uh, the impact on the community. And as Darren and others and... Uh, the, the meeting last week, we were able to talk a lot about this project. It is going to remove blighted properties uh, in downtown. It's going to eliminate polluted uh, soils uh, near Falls Park. It's going to create new parking spaces uh, 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 along the streets and around the project. This is going to benefit uh, not only the project, but the public and uh, patrons of Falls Park and other, air, uh, other uh, uh, users up in that part of downtown. I think this is a real significant one we've all seen from the scale of the, the drawings. This is a game changer for this part of downtown in terms of the developments that are being uh, proposed. Over 200 residential units, approximately 20,000 feet of retail, a scale and a quality that we've uh, really longed for in this part of downtown. And it becomes a nice uh, a bookend, if you will, and a compliment to Falls Park uh, to really, uh, I think, transform uh, that entire area and the surrounding areas. Uh, and lastly, we've got kind of a, uh, I think, uh, many would argue not a street that kind of fits the typical uh, fall standards. This project will rebuild Second Street as well and give that true connection uh, to Falls Park from the west. So that's another uh, asset of this project going forward. If you talk about eligible uses, and we, we may be able to discuss this a little bit more with the project plan next week, uh, but these are the uses of funds that would be eligible, uh, again, kind of under historic guidelines as well as uh, statute. Uh, I won't go through them uh, line by line other than to, to kind of repeat that number at the bottom. There's about $5.5 million in expenses that would be eligible. The, the kind of three that we've most focused on as we've uh, negotiated this agreement, uh, the first two there, the uh, demolition of that brighter property, getting that property uh, offline and getting a clean slate for that property so we can do a more quality development. The second one, uh, uh, we are talking about some very dirty 
uh, soils. Uh, historically, it's uh, been a salvage yard and uh, other remnants of being adjacent to a rail yard. And then uh, about midway down, I'm going to kind of combine the main avenue, Phillips Avenue, and the 2nd Street into to one, which is a real significant street infrastructure piece. That's the piece that rebuilds 2nd Street and adds those, uh, you know, 100 plus parking spaces in that vicinity. Lastly, uh, going back to that necessity piece, and I, you know, put but for up there on purpose. That's kind of the jargon uh, it's often used, and you see it a lot in other states, and it's in the context of, you know, would a project go forward but for TIF? And in this case, we are always evaluating to find out what that tipping point is. In this case, they've got a total project budget that has excessive, excessive cost compared to other projects. That, again, those three things I just mentioned, uh, environmental mitigation and abatement, the public infrastructure, uh, including the streets, and some utility work that occurs on that site. We're also looking at the overall model, you know, our cost of construction within the realm of what we would expect. They are in this case. We look at the operating projections of the project. Are they uh, consistent with the market conditions and industry standards? In this case, we believe it is. Uh, as we look at this whole project, then we do believe that that tipping point on this project is $4.1 million. $4.1 million is a shortfall in this project. It, it will not go forward uh, without this sort of infusion of closing that project gap. I want to talk about the taxes on this, and, and any time we're talking about tax increment, what you're really talking about is existing conditions versus future conditions and how those taxes are expected to change. We, we do no project on this site. Uh, there's really uh, very little taxes uh, relatively. Uh, $8,000 in taxes are paid annually. The, uh, for for uh, context, the property valuation is about $300,000. So that's where those $8,000 in taxes are generated. Uh, with the project, and once it, when it's done, uh, the owner will immediately be paying uh, taxes on those improvements. And you know, when we get into uh, uh, expected valuation into the 20s of millions, uh, that's a $455 uh, million dollar tax bill uh, that, the, that, that the owner would pay uh, going forward. Uh, the difference between those is what we call the increments, so about $445,000 uh, 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 gets redirected into the project. So as the project goes forward, those existing taxes flow to those taxing entities as they normally would, but we allow for a period of time those taxes to offset those extraordinary expenses that are occurring on the project. And then you know, going forward, you see uh, the total tax payment and the distribution to the individual taxing entities that is a win-win a, a going forward. We get this tremendous project downtown. Uh, the community gets these uh, additional amenities from this project. Uh, we, we achieve some of the other things I've already mentioned. And there's new taxes paid. So from a, a fiscal bottom line of those taxing entities, that is a win also. As I mentioned, we've got those three things coming. Uh, the development agreement is, is online and um, uh, we've taken great care to make sure we've negotiated an agreement that covers everything that we feel the city needs to cover in there. And we've worked with outside counsel on that. Greg Greenfield uh, is our attorney. He's also here tonight. A couple things I want to share about the development agreement and would be happy to expand in any other areas if needed. This is a non-bonded TIF, and that term probably by itself might not mean a lot. Uh, kind of the classic TIF model would be uh, the city, if it approved a TIF, would actually be, be the one responsible for sourcing the, the amount of money. So in this case, 4.1, and oftentimes they would go to the bond market. The city would go into debt for $4.1 million and be kind of at risk that the uh, uh, projections come in, the taxes are paid and, and whatnot. And the city, uh, 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 several years ago, really moved to what you call a non-bonded TIF model or pay-as-you-go model, which really shifts that burden uh, and risk to the developer. So instead of the city sourcing that $4.1 million, it's going to be the developer's responsibility. The developer bears the risk that, that tax projections are accurate, that taxes get paid, uh, and, and it really puts the city in the best position possible to, to uh, uh, minimize its own risk. As I mentioned, uh, uh, our recommendation is that $4.1 million TIF. That's a limit. There are provisions in there that actually can see that number go down if, for example, uh, actual expenses come in uh, lower. Uh, we have a mechanism to lower the cost 
uh, of that or the, the, the ceiling on that TIF. And I did mention there is a you know there is a procurement of those sources, so there's going to be a debt component and a cost of financing that uh, will be included in that as well. Uh, at that 445 or so increment, we're projecting this TIF would be paid off in 13 to 14 years, which is less than the statutory maximum of 20 years. Uh, the last thing, we do have a couple requirements of the developer that I think are important. I, I won't get long-winded on those. Darren, I think, uh, already covered those, other than to say that the improvements do need to be completed in a timely manner. They do need to be completed as, uh, as we presented them here today. And uh, kind of on that same vein, uh, we do uh, get very specific on their design criteria to make sure that not only does it meet the downtown design standards, but that we're uh, getting the best project forward and, and making sure that uh, the quality of that project is, is going to be one we're truly proud of. So with that, uh, I am uh, certainly able to ask questions. Brent, thank you very much for your work. Appreciate it. You bet. Uh, Council, uh, any, uh, any comments on this? Uh, Councilor Starr? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Brent, uh, so the total cost of the TIF, if I heard you right, is 5.99 or 5.995 million when the finance charges and everything are rolled into the, the project. Uh, th th there's a slight variation there. Uh, when we put that list of expenses together, we're putting the actual expenses that we that the developer is expected to incur kind of to get the project off the ground. So that 5.5 that includes a couple other things that are not actually not in the, uh, in the development agreement itself. We are narrowing our focus in the development agreement kind of into those three categories, the environmental remediation, the uh, utilities, and the public infrastructure. So when we recommend 4.1 million uh, uh, in TIF, that is actually uh, uh, a portion of the 5.5 in that total list. Then of that $4.1 million, the actual cost of uh, uh, interest on that would be added to that. We've uh, put in the developer agreement a cap on interest, a fixed cap, so um, that is $1.8 million. So if for whatever reason things don't go to plan and, and interest might accrue faster than we thought it would, we've actually protected the city by, by limiting it in that way. So the, the financing cost that's included in the TIF is estimated at 1.8 million is what you're saying. Correct. So that's the, the financing. When you talked about um, the cost of the project with uh, pay as you go or non-bonded, mm -hmm. how much additional cost is that to the taxpayers to go that route rather than using municipal bonds that, that are tax-free? Yeah. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, and there, there's some uh, additional factors that go into a bond, it's oftentimes the best deal for the city for the developer to go procure their own funding. And that has to do with uh, just some of the additional security uh, required in some um, reserves and coverage ratios actually uh, 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 limit perhaps the proceeds from any bond. So ultimately in the long run, it's a better deal for the city uh, if that financing is procured privately. But there's an additional cost by going that route rather than the uh, city. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time this afternoon talking about uh, cost of bonds and bonding and bond council and the things that go with it. Yep. But in this, out of the 1.8 million, the taxpayers are shifting the risk. There's a cost to shifting that risk yeah. um, to the developer. I know the developer, at least in the meetings that I had with them, said that they would have preferred going with public financing because it would have cost less. But I'm trying to get to yeah. where, what that additional cost is by shifting the risk to the city. If you'd sure. like, maybe we well, can do this next week. Well, that yeah, part I, of it I'd be would happy be, to uh, do that. We've actually in the past kind of modeled one version versus the other. And so I'd be happy to show it. Certainly the city oftentimes gets a better interest rate, but there are some other pieces that offset that. So I'll, I'll model that for you. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. Um, the other thing I learned today, and I wanna make sure that I, I understood this correctly, the school district's portion of the TIF, this, by state statute, the school district just raises taxes to cover their portion of it, and that, pa that cost is passed on to property owners within the, the TIF uh, boundary or in the, the school district boundaries as well. So the school district itself doesn't take 
um, a hit as part of this or their funding isn't reduced. They're, we show that as part of their cost, but really the, the thing they do is they automatically go to the auditor's office and increase property taxes for the citizens. So there's kind of a both ways. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. Sure. And that might be one we can, can dive into a little bit deeper too. I mean, there are some things even with the state aid formula. I mean, the, the, the school district is a little bit different than the county and the city in, as far as how um, uh, TIF can affect their bottom line. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. So Councilor Erickson. Uh, I just wanted to address that. The property taxes aren't raised on that. Um, I um, have dealt with this when I was on the taxation committee as well as um, here and talked with um, the director of property and special taxes, Mike Howdy Shell with Department of Revenue. And the way that it operates is school districts are always held harmless. They are made whole by the state, uh, state to aid education, whatever it is. And I'll just read this here that I have. Um, TIF districts are included within the total valuation that determines local efforts. Since a TIF district's property tax growth finances the TIF, the state offsets this revenue loss to schools by increasing its contribution to state aid. So the state is then kicking in additional dollars um, for um, the school districts. They're, they're always held harmless with a TIF. And as most of you know, if I can just elaborate a little bit, as most of you know that there is a, um, an effort by uh, Governor Dugard, uh, there's a work group on tax increment financing, and there's been four different things um, that have been identified by the Secretary Gerlach to address. That started on March 6th this last year. There was a bunch of, my opinion, dangerous changes potentially made to TIFs, and so um, our, our lobbyist for the Municipal League has had a seat at the table as well as others in Sioux Falls to really monitor that and making sure that this mechanism is still able, we're still able to do this. TIFs were created in 1978, so this isn't a new strategy that we use. Um, you know, when I first started on the council, I'll say I was a little cautious in um, TIFs, which we should be, and I find that you're probably much more conservative in your TIF um, giving um, maybe than what sometimes I think you should. For example, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And they have qualified under the state law regulations of all these things that, that qualify, but that doesn't mean you get it all, sorry applicant, that's just kind of the way it works. Um, as far as the bonding, um, other municipalities do that more than us. I think we have one on the books and that's the Sharapa, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for that instance, um, there is more risk to the taxpayer. There is way more risk to the taxpayer when we bond that. And um, I haven't heard from the applicant. Uh, I certainly don't want to speak for the applicant, but I'd be curious their opinion if if that was the route they would want to go. I'm, I'm not certain it was. I have been in a few meetings and heard different things. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about with this, there, there's been this perception that this is we're a tax giveaway. We're giving $455,000 of tax giveaway. And that is not true. That's just not how it works. Um, the way that it is right now, there's taxes being paid on that. We're capturing that growth and reinvesting that in for public improvement. Um, this is additional funds that um, this developer is taking on themselves that the citizens don't have to. It's, it's additional funds that free up in the CIP. Um, they're doing $1.3 million of street and public parking improvements. It's a big deal. That's additional funding that then is freed up for us to use downtown or within that MOU that it's, it's in, in there for 17 and 18. Um, and so I, I, they're going to continue to pay the taxes on that. Sure, it's a less amount, but when we're done, we have so much growth, and that growth is then paid down on the TIF for the time being. One of the other things that I just want to address is, you know, the base value of all these TIFs that we've done. I know we've been really criticized on that a lot lately, and um, that base value for the TIF is approximately $25 million. The assessed value of that is $150 million, you guys. That's a big deal. If I'm a business person, boy, that's a big deal. It's five times the amount. So we started with $25 million, we go to $150 million. I'm not great at math, but boy, I can figure that one out. So I just wanna, I just wanna make sure that we, we're 
really getting all of the answers. If you have additional questions on exactly how this works, counties can do TIFs as well. I know that was a misinformation. Um, they can do it out in the county. They can do those. I don't know how many they do, but that was created. And through the time, uh, TIFs have really changed a lot over the years. You can do it for economic development now, um, which was not in there. And so we saw a little bit of an increase for doing that. This TIF to me is a no-brainer. I mean, we're talking about blighted area. We're talking about the additional public improvements next to the Levitt Shell. Um, this all goes together. I mean, I know I don't need to convince you of this, but I just want to make sure we really understand. There's a few tips where I went, oh, I don't know. Is this all right? Is this, you know, and I've questioned you, and you've come back with the information that I needed to be okay with it. And this one just, just makes sense. And so I'd encourage you to reach out to the uh, Department of Revenue for their take on this. I'd encourage you to reach out to uh, Darren and, and Brent as well and, and look at the information of what is included. This is allowed by state statute. It's pretty simple for me. So just want to clear up a few of the maybe misinformations out there as well as answer any questions. I've got a ton more information and I can happy to answer those too if anybody wants to. So I'll move approval. Thank you, Councillor. Is there a second on that? Thank you, Councillor. We need a second? Or yes. A, yeah, that'll be a second. Thank you, Councillor Rolfing. Appreciate it. There's been a motion to set a date of hearing second reading for Tuesday, September 19th. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, <clears throat> item 11. A resolution vacating the North Cockatiel Avenue right of way from the south right of way line of West Amber Street to 100.50 feet south. Good evening, Council. Kurt Peppel, Public Works Engineering. Uh, the vacation in question is uh, near the intersection of West 12th Street and Valley View Road in West Central Sioux Falls. Petition was prepared and submitted by Kelly Nielsen, who is the owner and the developer. The petition was signed by the adjoining property owner pursuant to South Dakota Law 99-4510. Petitioner has complied with the city street vacation policy. A neighborhood meeting was not required for this vacation. If the vacation is approved, an easement will be reserved for public and private utilities. Appro approval of this vacation will aid in the further development of this, end, of this area. Uh, engineering supports the vacation. Kurt, thank you. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Councilors? Move approval, Erickson. Second. Erpenbach. Council Vice Chair Erickson has made a motion to approve this item. Second by Council Erpenbach. A uh, roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 12. A resolution approving the special assessment role for the Main Street Business Improvement District in the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Good evening, Council. Dustin Powers with the Economic Development Office. Item 12 is asking for Council approval of a special assessment levy for the Main Street Business Improvement District. Uh, on the screen, uh, the Main Street uh, District is, the boundaries are depicted on the screen. Uh, they are roughly defined as Minnesota Avenue on the west side, 14th Street on the south side, uh, Franklin and Weber Avenues on the east side, and then Falls Park Drive on the north. Uh, the identified area is approximately 450 acres, and tonight's resolution um, would have an assessment levied on 248 properties within the district. Funds generated by the Business Improvement District are administered through Downtown Sioux Falls Incorporated. These funds are expended for the betterment of downtown through programming, services, and activities provided by Downtown Sioux Falls. Uh, those things include such things as their downtown uh, the downtown uh, clean and green team, which does the sh sidewalk sweeping and all the upkeep of the trash and collection in downtown. Um, it also includes the flower baskets that you see hanging along Phillips Avenue and some of the other uh, streets, as well as um, watering and maintenance of some of the other landscaping that is downtown. It includes the, the street banners that you see that promote uh, downtown Sioux Falls and the district, um, as well as some of the events and promotions that they do. Uh, Brianne Maynard with Downtown Sioux Falls is here this evening if there's any additional questions regarding uh, some of the services that they provide with the bid assessment. Uh, 
dollars. A couple of items that I just want to point out prior to turning back over to the council is that tonight's resolution is a cumulative assessment of $168,240.93 for all 248 properties. Uh, the maximum assessment of any one individual property is $1,700. Uh, the Main Street Business Improvement District uh, hasn't been in place since 1989, so this is the 28th year that we are seeking approval for this assessment. A notice of hearing was uh, published twice in the Argus Leader on both August 4th and August 11th of this hearing. Um, and each property owner was sent a copy of the notice of hearing um, with their, with their uh, assessment amount um, on August 10th. Uh, this item was brought in front of the Main Street Business Improvement District Board on August 23rd, and they recommended unanimous approval uh, to the City Council. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Dustin, thank you. Appreciate it. And Maria, and thank you as well. Folks, is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Councilors? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Second Silver. Thank you, uh, Councilor um, Rolfing, Councilor Erpenbach, thank you uh, for um, that. If there is a roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. <clears throat> Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Item 13. A resolution including certain contiguous territory within the corporate limits of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Annexation 7166 2017, Cactus Heights Townsite Edition. Uh, Jason Bieber representing Planning and Building Services. Uh, this is an application and the owner here is Jeff Broin. Uh, They're looking at annexing a small uh, 2.1 acre lot uh, southwest of the Great Bear Recreation Area uh, up in Imani Ridge Edition. Uh, the purpose of this is they're looking, or the owner is looking at incorporating this uh, lot into two existing lots to the north. Uh, and then he's looking at constructing a single family home on this uh, one combined lot. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Folks, anybody want to speak uh, to this item? Councilors? Second, Rolfing. Council Vice Chair Erickson has made a motion to approve this resolution. Second, I'd like Councilor um, um, Rolfing. Uh, yes, Councilor Starr. Thank sir. you. You're Jason, welcome. how does that affect the rest of the area? Are we, do you have a map of the, the entire? Uh, but, further out than just I, the I don't have a map of it of the entire area as you can see on this that Imani Ridge has that cul-de-sac there and mm -hmm. that's a private drive that then will connect into the Canterbury North subdivision um, and then that will have those two accesses the one that's already existing and then the um, temporary gravel access that they paved Marlow Avenue down to Madison Street but Around the property, what parts of it are in the city limits then? Uh, anything in the shaded in the gray here. So anything kind of to the south and west and the southeast, that's all still outside of city limits. That's all part of the Cactus Heights north and south subdivision. That's outside in Minneapolis County. So we're kind of creating an area that's out by itself in, in this, or am I missing? No, the, no, I'm, I'm it, it wouldn't create from. an area. Um, so, so to the see, so if you look at this map, this may be a little bit of a better idea here. That the area in purple is outside of city limits. The area in gray is all in city limits. So this is kind of the northeast corner of what's left in the Cactus Heights subdivision. So we wouldn't be creating an island. We would Perfect. keep a pretty big area to the south yet that's still not in that they have a pre-annexation agreement actually with us, so. In Madison, perfect, thank you. Thanks, Councilor Starr. A uh, roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Pass, pass, eight to zero, item 14. A resolution authorizing an application for financial assistance, authorizing the execution and submittal of the applications and designating an authorized representative to certify and sign payment requests. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. This item allows us to make application for financial assistance for the next uh, large storm drainage project. Uh, with me tonight is Lance Weatherly. He's the principal drainage engineer. He's guiding this project. Um, and Stockwell Engineers is our local engineering firm that's designing this project. We just have a few uh, slides to uh, frame this project up for you. Again, this is uh, the largest storm drainage improvement project that we've done in the last decade. 
It generally has a center point of 41st Street and Marion Road. Uh, it will uh, provide some um, real true 21st century storm drainage improvements to an area that started to be developed back in the 60s that just didn't have the uh, storm drainage standards as we do uh, today. There's been uh, a fair amount of property damage that's happened in, in large rain events. And so the overall concept is that area that is on your map that's left of Marion Road will collect the 100 year event and will end up putting it underground in Marion Park. We've got some pictures for you there. We'll release it slow and ultimately get it out to the um, interstate ditch. This is a picture of one of the uh, large areas that when a um, large rain event came through, it, it overtopped this uh, pr private property's retaining wall. A lot of silt went in their backyard, um, just again uh, driving the need for the purpose of the project. Uh, this gives you a picture of those two pictures on the bottom. We did a very similar improvement at Edison Middle School where um, we've got two miles of 96 inch diameter pipe underneath the Edison Middle School track and field. Um, the picture on the left is during construction. The picture on the right is after. Uh, it's worked very well. Uh, captures and retains those flows and then releases them slowly. There's an image on the top uh, that gives you a perspective of what we'll end up working with the Parks Department on so we can install a very similar underground system in Marion Park. Um, we're also, when we're in this area, we're going to make a number of other improvements to the water main system, sanitary sewer, street lights, asphalt overlays, and some streets that are tired that need to be brought up to standard, and some other site improvements. Here's a picture of uh, the project and the loan request. So the loan request will be 8.4 million. Uh, the total project estimate is 10.9 million. Um, we're very fortunate to tie into the state revolving fund dollars at 1% interest and the reflective schedule is there tonight is just to allow us to submit for financial assistance. And then with these projects, when they're clean water funds, we also um, benefit from the reduced interest rate and then we'll be investing about uh, $429,000 um, uh, in funding up north in the basin to uh, improve the water quality of the Big Sioux River. That's our presentation for you and we would ask you to support uh, this application for funding assistance. Thank you, Mark. Uh, did anybody want to speak to this item in the audience tonight? Very good. Councilors? Yeah, I'm Councilor Nancy, sir. This is a this is a very important project and it needs to be done, but as uh, Marion Park, they use it a lot for football. Kids use it for football and stuff. Do you have any idea what the timeline is of, as far as, you know, it's <laughs> being essentially probably torn up and then, and then restoration? Um, well, uh, we're working closely right now with the Parks Department. That is the only uh, area in town that I understand that they play rugby. And so as a part of the project, we're actually going out to the Sanford Sports Complex. There were some fields laid out for that. We're going to replace and grade um, a, a rugby field out there, get irrigation on it, um, and actually get that work done this year to get a growing season on it. Um, we've also worked with the Parks Department to do some ADA upgrades. Um, and so I don't know the exact schedule for the, like the small kid football that happens out there, but the rugby, we are going to replace out there. And, Lance is working through those details as well. Great. Oh. Move Cal to approve, Neinsert. Thank you, Councilor Neinsert. Second, Rolf. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council Member Staley. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Neinsert. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Star. Yes. And it's passed eight to zero. Item fifteen. A resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving diagonal parking on Dakota Avenue. Good evening, everybody. Heath Hofteiser, Principal Traffic Engineer for the City of Sioux Falls. Um, I'm here tonight for to get approval for diagonal parking on Dakota Avenue. This is an area between 8th Street and 6th Street on the west side of Dakota Avenue. Basically, it's in front of our existing 8th and Dakota parking ramp and what would be the new city administration building. The idea behind it is to um, take the same Main Avenue road diet that's been successful in Main Avenue, apply it to this section of 
Dakota Avenue, where we'll take away one of the lanes of traffic, take it, or so we'll take it from three lanes of traffic to two lanes of traffic, and then increase the parking density, which would be right in front of the new city administration building. Any questions? Oh, that's it. Good job, Heath. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak about additional parking? Very good. Good job, Heath. Uh, Councilor, thank you, Councilor Ruffing. Second. Second. Thank you, Councilor Erpenbach. Appreciate that. Uh, a roll call, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Star? Yes. Councilor said it's passed 8 to 0. Item 16. A resolution approving the release of a 24-foot public access easement and sanitary sewer easement located in lots 3C and 4A and Tract 1 of St. Michael's Addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Uh, good evening, uh, Kurt Peppel, Public Works Engineering. I will try to be as quick as Heath. <laughs> uh, this. <clears throat> Excuse me. This easement is near 26th and Marion Road by the St. Michael's Church. It is on the back side of the new tires, tires, tires uh, development. Sayer Associates, on behalf of the owner, has requested the easement release. Uh, engineering easement release procedures have been followed. Uh, the easement uh, <clears throat> contains no facilities and is no longer needed due to a new easement that is um, accommodating the access and sanitary sewer needs. That was established in August of 2016. Engineering supports the easement release. Thanks, Kurt. Did anybody want to speak to this item in, in the audience? Uh, Councilors? Move to approve. Second, Selberg. Council Chair uh, Kyle has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Selberg. Any roll call, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That has passed. Eight to zero. Item 17. A resolution approving the release of a part of a permanent easement located in Tract 5 of Fishinix addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Lincoln County, South Dakota. Another easement release. This one is near 85th and Minnesota in South Central Sioux Falls. Willardson Lawn Engineering, on behalf of the owner, has re requested the easement release. Engineering easre easement release procedures have been followed. Uh, the dark blue area shows a new easement that has been established, and it, which will accommodate the drainage needs in that area, so the yellow uh, area is no longer needed. Um, releasing this portion of the easement will aid in the development of the property. Easement engineering supports the easement release. Thanks, Kurt. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Council. Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second. Councilor Box made a motion to approve this resolution. Second by Councilor Chair Kiley. A roll call, please. Council Member Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you, Council. Uh, now on to new business, uh, Councilor Rolfing. Yes, I just have one piece of information. I'd like to make sure everyone uh, got the email from uh, Kim Schroeder, our manager of the um, internal audit division, that we uh, have appointed. Uh, she and I looked at or interviewed two candidates for the audit committee, the outside uh, candidates, and we have decided on Rose Grant to become part of the audit committee, and would appreciate your support of her next week uh, for that uh, resolution. If you have any questions, please get a hold of me. Yeah. Councilor Rolfing, thank you. Council, uh, would anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. There's been a motion to adjourn, and it's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. This means adjourn to falls. Make it a great night. Aye.